Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I am your host, Chris Spangle. We Are Libertarians brings you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves. Think of us as the love child of National Review and Mad Magazine. We explain to you what the hell is happening in our world today and how we can fix it by thinking differently. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes, like us on pay, uh, like us on Facebook, like us on PayPal too. MySpace as well. Or Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com. We are supported by listeners like you, so $1 per episode by pledging $5 a month helps us grow. And we are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at WeAreLibertarians.com. If you are new to the program, we catch up for the first 20 minutes or so, uh, and then we deep dive into analyzing current events in society from a libertarian perspective. This show is for adults by semi-adults, so please be warned the language is strong and offensive. Uh, Chief Diversity Officer <laughs> is uh, Greg Lenz. Greg, how are you? Doing well, buddy. How are you, Chris? I'm I'm doing... I've had a day. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know how you're doing this today. <laughs> if I had been through the cruel and unusual punishment that you were subject to the last two, three right. hours... We talked about that. Uh, my I'll, blood pressure would be 300. I'd be stroking out. <laughs> also with us is Kat Anagnos. Kat, how are you? Hello. Uh, I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, well, <laughs> she she was uh, she was appointed a co-host of the show. Yeah, I'm officially a co-host of We Are Libertarians. You kind of free range to that. Now like, it's the three of us, buddy. We're the three you best. So oh <laughs> but my god, the gang's all here. But <laughs> oh my god. Then she started. She's eating, singing Hitler again. <laughs> then she started singing. Uh, then she started eating chips during the <laughs> intro. She was singing Taylor Swift. She wiped a booger on my back. <laughs> she did. I did not. Her hands are so <laughs> greasy. Uh, we are also live streaming to our Facebook group, which you can join at WeAreLibertarians.com. There's a link there, and you can watch the uh, live stream. We are taking questions. Uh, Stone just asked in the group, so please feel free to ask. And we are we are now recording every show, and we're pulling chunks out, so if you want to share with your friends uh, any of the policy points that we make, then without all of the 20 minutes of fun at the beginning... The good part. You just get right to the uh, to the Greg's the autism. Weaponized. Uh, then uh, check out our YouTube channel. Please go and subscribe and uh, check out the playlist that has all our clips on it. Uh, man, I'll tell you what. Uh, I've had a day, Greg. <laughs> uh, I, listen, Spangle always says how he's shocked that you know he's never been with somebody as much as as long as he's been with me and he's exposed shocked. other consistent other, exposure he's never tired of me other than today. is that right other than my wife so right. i'll be honest the first two years we podcasted together i didn't think she was real really? that was when that that linebacker for notre dame had a fake girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah and i i said oh there's lene cacao spangle <laughs> <laughs> because she would never be around that is when true we podcasted. well she was going to uh beauty school at the time oh yeah she and, was working like nine jobs and god i wish she had stayed there <laughs> <laughs> she should have got a phd <laughs> no uh she's she's great she's doing well yeah. um yeah and uh we're, we're great success story you two have hashed it out and been civil and are an example of we're how those things is should that work. the body in the basement that I've <laughs> yes <been> that's <laughs> the smell <laughs> Uh, and, and then I got Thanks, a cat. Thanks, Tad. I got a cat. <laughs> yep, you cucked her. Yep. Now, uh, but no, second only on that list to my ex-wife is Kat Anagnos. Uh, right. She's an intern by day. She's an intern by night. <laughs> no, I'm a co-host by night now. Co-host by true. night. That's right, yeah. And Self-appointed. The three best friends. <laughs> oh, my God. The gang's all here now. Well, more of the greasy fingers on the shirt. <laughs> oh, yeah, Lay's doesn't leave any grease at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm good. Oh, no, 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 no. You're no, going to no, ask no. for him back. No, I'm done. No. No, you're not. I'm watching my figure. People are watching <laughs> me right now. I'm watching your figure. <laughs> Judging. <laughs> you sound oh. like Caitlin Kapetsky. I know, I know. Oops. Now, uh, Kat, you you and I, we spend a lot of time together, and we genu I genuinely enjoy it. Do yeah. you? Yes. That wasn't convincing, was it, Greg? <laughs> I don't know. That, I think it was for Kat. She's, you know, it's hard to tell with her, her right. uh, yeah, occasional emotional. awkward demeanor. <laughs> She's not Excuse good at me? sincere. <laughs> she, it makes her uncomfortable. Oh, right. You want to like you're a really I'm talented, cat. <laughs> really talented. I'm so glad you're a co-host. <laughs> you, <laughs> I'll tell you off air what really makes her uncomfortable. You want to see uh, a full meltdown? Oh my god! Yeah. Really? Yeah. You can get rustled. Yes. No. Yes. Really? I figured it out today. Thank oh, you for listening to We Are Libertarians. Were you alluding to it in chat earlier when we discovered about your um, bi curious face? <laughs> hey, I've got photos of you, mister. <laughs> oh, you do. You do. I have very. Uh, my Facebook page is incriminating. Like, it's a hate crime. We were. We were. For another project, <laughs> we were going through your Facebook page today, and she was dying laughing. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, my, my Halloween. Co you know the Halloween costume oh, party I have every year. Oh, yeah. Or I attend. I, but now it's not as much fun because people are too sensitive. One year, Greg went as a 
a trash can of fetuses. Victims of the liberal agenda. <laughs> <laughs> I bought I bought uh, corn syrup, red food dye, and a bunch of Cabbage Patch dolls at Walmart, and the woman just shook her head. And then a, and a trash uh, trash bag, and then gray um, cardboard paper, so she kind of knew it was coming. And then uh, and I just wanted the top of a trash can, not the not you, the full thing. Not the actual trash can that's on the inside. Yeah, you, I made it out of a hula hoop. <laughs> interestingly, you wore an LL Cool J outfit. Yeah, so I've been twice. I have been. Um, multicultural um, <laughs> and yeah. won awards for both of those. Right. What um, awards from who? David Duke? Well, no, that's the thing is it's who can be the most offensive and like no one would talk to me because <laughs> the first time you were in blackface. The first time I went blackface, Alan Keys, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was at a party in Bloomington, Indiana, which is basically like the Berkeley of the Midwest. Yes. And made the mistake of going to this, had a buck. I, I went through the drive through at KFC in Mooresville, oh. painted black with the um, with my Rastafarian wig on. And then my, my sw- I guess you could say my bling, because I had rings and chains and everything. But in Mooresville, they didn't blink? Oh, he oh, he was he was one of my brothers. And so, <laughs> oh, no. and so he gave me, and I go, I, I don't want anything in it. I just want... I just want the bucket. And then I had bought a the Colt thing of Colt 45 and I won hands down. But one of those individuals came up to me because they had gone as Fudgems. Remember Fudgems from Domino's? Define they. Harry's brother. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he, this person doesn't know me, comes up to me and gives me, he and his girlfriend give me the most hateful <laughs> look I have ever seen. And I knew I ruined the party immediately. I mean, I just, I wrecked it. And this is, this is before... 4 a.m. when the person who hosted it, their girlfriend ended up leaving because me and my buddy that I had sent you a link to today, Uh we had stapled the Confederate flag to the wood awning in front of their house and blared (laughs) David Allen Coe and opened up all the windows at 4 a.m. in Bloomington. And his girlfriend left, hit my car, backed out of the driveway, and never spoke to me again. (laughs) How to win friends and influence people. Hey, I won the award. (laughs) That's all that matters. That's all that matters. For Halloween this year, I won the award for, I went as Hillary Clinton and her demons. I have noticed. And I wore a pantsuit. Demons. Demons. I wore a pantsuit and I dressed like Hillary Clinton. And then my friend wore a slutty devil costume with Mm -hmm. pieces of paper taped to her that said like, uh, Lewinsky dress or Monica Lewinsky uh, emails the Clinton Foundation like all of this stuff right. and it was hilarious. That yeah. was I though was like, is Cat a liberal? Like when I saw that I was a little like oh, I don't even know yeah. if I like her anymore. Why it's I didn't know you. But it's her demons and it's like all of her scandals. You were smiling and had the Hitler hail. Ex- in the that picture. wasn't a that wasn't a giveaway that I was one of. That you. isn't a demon. <laughs> No, she's the demon. I'm just Hillary Clinton. I gotcha. I'm, I'm worried that people are going to start thinking that we're offensive. We are highly offensive. <laughs> we're yeah. waging the war of, of offensiveness. I mean, this has been one for the record books. It has. Tell you. Started June, off with the BBC and then now <laughs> the, the BBD, the, the, the liberal agenda. I have to commend you. You didn't go with Big Black Cock, which is what Nice would tell us is one of the top trending. It's true. Porn up searches, which he keeps tabs on. So tell us more about our day. I've blacked out. <laughs> so that happened. And you really did, literally. I'm waiting for <laughs> Greg to show up to the podcast. Um, no, this has been going on for hours. Don't put it on okay, me. Okay, so for a few, an hour, maybe two, three, four. Two. Um, I, At least. Here's the thing. Sp- okay, because of my love for Taylor Swift, I've you know, talked about her music nonstop to Spangle, who I like. I like to share things that I love. And the conspiracy theories and that the surround conspiracy her. Theories. Right. So I the radical it all with, lesbianism, Lesbian. right, right, let's be honest. But uh, I I shared it with Spangle, and today, um, well, because last night he texted me. Oh, well, actually, I got a text this morning, and it said, <laughs> "Actually, I'm going to pull this up." Do you remember this? This was hilarious. I was just infamous be- sleep texter Chris well, Spangle. She, oh, I sleep text all the time. It's getting bad. Like I'm, st- I'm going to have to start leaving my phone in the other room. All right, so it's getting in, like it's getting in situations. I texted a girl something about two weeks ago. And it was, uh, she w- like sent me this heartfelt message, and I replied, LOL, ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Best reply ever. And, and <laughs> Oops, I, didn't I, mean that. Wrong wrong person. I tried and cleaning it up the next day, and it didn't, nothing worked. You can't Not take good. back an LOL. No. Nope. You never can. <laughs> never. But uh, Spangle, I told him, hey, why don't you listen to her new best album and <laughs> just listen to the lyrics and tell me what you think? Because he's listened to it before you like it. 1989, right? Right. And so we did, and I get a text <laughs> at 8.58 a.m. this morning, and it said, I think Out of the Woods is one of the best relationship songs of all time. I really listened to the lyrics for the first time. I don't think I've ever heard a song that better captures what it's like in a relationship, ever. 
It begins by talking about Who the. wrote this? I did. It begins by talking about the incredible joy of starting a relationship that fits and now. comes with the first few months of dating, with the insecurity of knowing. Uh, yeah. No. Where did you copy that off of no, on the I, internet? No, it's a full breakdown of the whole, he of the whole song. He fully broke it down, and then that's when I knew we were meant to be. And so we <laughs> sat down, and we watched. I showed him all of her newest uh, music videos, and we analyzed all of them with the we hidden did. messages. And then I showed him some of her older work, which the really, like... When she was like a straight savage. When and she lived out of her car. Oh, there's a song that she wrote about John Mayer that is one of the most savage things I've ever seen in my life. She dated John Mayer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, he there's ruined. such a big, big he age difference. That's the problem. She, right. She was like 19 and he basically like, she's basically. John Mayer her? Basically like, you <laughs> fucking raped me and like. <laughs> Like, dude, if you, we're gonna sit you down after the podcast and make you watch this video, you need to. No, it's, and I will never do it. No. I, I will, I will quit before I will do what it. What did I tell you afterwards? Uh, we were talking about the differences between you and I. Mm-hmm. Oh, Spangle There's said not many. No. Right, but except Ex- for <laughs> Spangle said that if Greg would have been around, he would have killed himself. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> That's t- that, 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 she is so vapid and like not deep and ridiculously no. bad. Oh, Greg or Spangle, tell no. him. No, you, you're a co-host now. You handle it yourself. Well, he's considerate of other people's opinions, even if they're bad. I'm not. That's the big difference. Well, I told him I was like, hey, if you want me to stop, like this is the fourth music video, you can tell me to stop. And he said no, he I'm was wondering how far you'd autism out and just letting you go. I was letting her go. Yeah, down the rabbit hole. But he was okay. go to this Tumblr and read about here. See, check out this conspiracy oh. theory. Alex Jones should have her on. We we had we we hit Tumblr last week. Yeah, that was last week. Come on, keep up with it. I I would say that on any given day, I hear about Taylor Swift for a solid hour. And is, that it is it for real or is it an act? Don't shake your head at me. No, it's 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 real. Like here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> like you're, you're, you, you, she feels about Taylor Swift the way you feel about Donald Trump. Although oh. her feelings may be stronger because you, yeah, because like I can, you can still criticize. be criticize him. Yeah, no, right. I can criticize her. Really? <laughs> yeah. You were afraid that people showed up during our last podcast because you were talking negative and calling her a lesbian and feeding the gossip. I said she was possibly bisexual, and she had an Illuminati that like prevented people from speaking out <laughs> um, against her on podcast. It's true. There's in real proof time. on the Tumblr, which I sent you, and clearly you didn't you review did the. It? Clearly, you didn't review the show notes, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. No. Um. Here's the thing. Spangle took me to the Indianapolis 500 Speedway, and he showed me. <laughs> everything for three hours about IndyCar and while I respected it very true but here's the thing I genuinely enjoyed hearing how you know obsessed he was with it and hearing about one of his many passions he doesn't like reveal that ever but you're almost moral levels of autism on the on the track he's he's bigger than I am but yeah no one is close to moral right no but Jeremiah has a he transcends the track right so he's He's forcing people to to love what he loves. Yes. And here's the thing. I'm just a genuinely curious person, and I like to learn about everything. So yeah, she is. last week, okay, well, last week we were learning about, we were watching all the documentaries when I got woke, remember? <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, Spangle's always like, so what are you really passionate about? And I'm like, well, I have a bunch of different interests until he found out Taylor Swift. <laughs> how much I love learning about like her. Three or four weeks ago, we went to the gym. Like, she, you know, so she's I was learning been about the gym. I was learning about health, fitness, um, cooking. Um, <laughs> fitness pizza in your mouth. Um, all right. Well, um, what else were we learning about? All the Alex Jones conspiracy things, the Kennedys. <laughs> yeah, the Kennedy conspiracy everything. So Did now, you read through my notes on that? Mm-hmm. I put together like 15 pages on that. Exactly. I could put I together 15 pages of Taylor Swift. <laughs> well, and here's... Full here's, investigation. <laughs> yeah. What's funny. He has the documents. I have the documents. <laughs> I wrote them, but they're the documents. See, and it's funny because I just have so many interests and I love learning about everything. So well-rounded. But, right, I'm just basically great. But when it comes to Taylor Swift, I don't know how much I'm freaking out about it until what? I look how at the clock and it's four How much further could you actually hours. go? No, like down the well. Jeremiah level uh, at the But 500, I mean, she's on like, Tumblr's about conspiracy theories that she's a lesbian. Like, how much more is there to investigate on this iceberg? Everything. You, Greg, pages and pages of notes. Is she a lizard person? There's a theory about that. I'm telling you, you remember the Boston b- b- bombing and 4chan and Reddit after that? The w- yeah. Like, that's what Tumblr is for Taylor Swift. Oh, absolutely. I'm telling you. I just didn't know if you were a content creator or a voyeur. There's a big difference in your mental stability. No, I've never created anything like that. Um, I don't have the time or the capability. I just enjoy it. I I just, here's the thing. Most of it I don't believe, but I like reading it. It's just entertaining to me. Okay. See, that's fine. That's the way I feel about 4chan poll. 
see and i just i never create any of it but i'm like oh my god this is crazy these people because here's the thing i'm I ha- I like to think I have a life enough to not sit down for hours going through combing through her log you know flight logs. And All evidence to the contrary. <laughs> <laughs> no, literally. Well, I read the other master posts Kat, about it. Cat is genuinely one of the most curious people that I've ever met. Thank like, you. Like, not sexually. That's not what. That's I why mean. my friends call me Whiskers. <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden, I am not an intern here, and all of a sudden, this is just just the sexual you know. harassment. Raining down from above Yikes. at weird. At the end of the day, did you find yourself sucking a black penis <laughs> on a Google search? <laughs> no, you didn't. Is that, don't no. Tell me more about your bad day. I've had a bad <laughs> day. Yeah. <laughs> right, sorry. No, uh, she's genuinely one of the most curious people I've ever met. She asks more, like, my little brother asks so many questions as a kid. And you know, like, that phase where, like, they get to three to five where they just start asking everything about the world? And they already know the answer to most of it you've told them? That's kind of where she's at in life, I think. And so she just asks a lot of questions. <laughs> it's and, not annoying, uh, is it? No, not, not to me. I think Good. you drive him crazy. No, I, I, th- I, find it, I find it in small doses incredibly charming. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I think Two that, hours a week's perfect. And I think that you, if you've listened to the last few podcasts, like, cra- Crack... Kidding. Cat asks Greg. I meant uh, Crag. <laughs> Crag. It's our couple name. Yeah, it's our couple name. Oh dear God, more <laughs> grease. Uh, Crag. Uh, Cat asks Greg a lot of questions. She asks us a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. They're good questions, though. They're not crap, th- crappy questions. So we were talking last night, and what? W- I mean, you don't, don't go into everything we were talking about. Cat. Cat and I a lot of times talk about like really offensive things, because a lot of times you can't have conversations about really offensive concepts. Right. Without someone, without like, someone getting mad, telling you, no one will wrong. go to the truth. Exactly. exactly. Like we were talking about, like this. I'm not going to say what, but like just the science of and the study of people and it's right. just, psychology. It's just so interesting. And oh so, yeah. So she was asking, you know, like, do you think that these certain things, these certain music, like she asks a lot of questions about 50 years from now. Yeah. Like, do you think that things that we're experiencing now will be the same way? in 50 years like that's a great question yeah thanks um and you you specifically asked about what right oh so we're just gonna dive right in i yeah. okay well here's my question did we get through how bad of a day you had did yeah. we accurately frame Wait, it before we did i want to know spangle <laughs> yes after all of the all of these stuff i told you about taylor swift not only like her music and her lyrics and her life and the relationships but about her business model about her all of that what would you say I'd say that you're a really big fan. So you don't think it was interesting? No, it absolutely was. No, I, she's more complex than people anything think. Anything if abs- you really dig in becomes interesting. No, it's like, just getting past that threshold. Exactly. Like I thought Taylor Swift was like kind of like Katy Perry, just kind of like a bubblehead pop star. But John Benet Ramsey, Kat, right? John Benet Ramsey, <laughs> yes. In talking to Cat, Taylor Swift is a very complex individual who's lived like an interesting life, and she's like her lyrics kind of represent all this stuff. Oh, she's an American. She's definitely an American yeah. success story. Like what, what her and oh her mom yeah. sacrificed to make it. Yeah. Exactly. So if you kind of like, if you basically what Cat is doing, she's watching uh, like a reality. Yeah, I bit my tongue. A reality TV show of Taylor Swift's life, mm-hmm. and it's a really interesting life. Almost like a full documentary. Honestly, it is. Some might say like the Truman Show with Jim Carrey. She's very cats just yeah. always watching. So no, I found it really interesting, and I Good, I think glad. her music is uh, is quality stuff. I always thought that. Like when I had never listened to any Taylor Swift until Ryan Adams did a cover of the 1990, yeah. 1989 album, and I heard that I was like, this is amazing. I wonder what the actual album's like. And I listened to it. I was like, this is really good. Oh, yeah. she has a so. really good talent for writing catchy beats, which is the hardest part. Like a yeah. lot of people oh, yeah. can write lyrics, and her mm. she she's really good at just sort of knowing what's going to be a hit. Exactly. Yeah. No. So no, I had a great time today. Good. I, I just like like cat cat and whole I, lot of cat. No, I, I like cat and I intellectually are on the same level, and so it's it's very much like you and I. You know, like when you meet somebody that you're just like, hey, blah blah. blah you know, so it's it's always an interesting time. Isn't it amazing about. how you know immediately? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. just going back to the like, just immediately clicking thing is, and just being curious is that I have you know i i liked her music so i kind of like learned a bit about her i was like all right she's just whatever and then i was like oh wow she's complex and more than she puts out so that's why i asked spangle i was like what do you think she's gonna be like in you know 10 years is this gonna be a beat you know what i mean so all of our conversations uh stem from taylor swift like and about the music industry it's funny the kennedy assassination like you know how the matrix ended up like an entire <laughs> boutique industry of like the philosophy and tau of the matrix like yeah this is kind of what's happening with Taylor Swift. She's going to be... Well, like, Beyonce has, like, transcended the human experience. Exactly. But she's they got, all do. Like, Lady Gaga. 
Beyonce has become douchey though. She's yeah, become a they all do. You, she's, they yeah. they their their sense of self importance like takes them to a level where they think they're demigods. Someone on exactly. the uh, Facebook Live said, "Of course, Chris and Cat get along. He's a cat person." <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> who said that? Uh, I didn't see who it was. Um, um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, so great day. I'm sorry, but that was your payback for taking me to the speedway. I didn't know you hated the Speedway that I much. didn't hate it. I, She's too nice I, to ru- no. ruin your rain no. in the parade. No. Honestly, it the exact same thing you said about me. I didn't. I thought that the Speedway was just a bunch of cars going around. I didn't right. realize that it was... Left turns at high speeds for four hours. Exactly. Yeah. I didn't know it, it was so complex and the science behind the cars. and Right. So I feel like... Engines and stuff. There, there was a point about eight hours into the day <laughs> where I looked over and I just saw her like tired and you just can tell oh okay this girl's exhausted and she's had enough of this oh let's let's he was like do you want to leave and i was like no we can keep going no you're having fun let's no it wasn't that she was uh, you must be a great actress because you genuinely sounded like you wanted to keep going i did no i was i was interested at 200 decibels you can hide a lot of uh, (laughs) (laughs) intonations that give it away no it is fine it's fine all right exactly but I was gonna. Oh, so so where did your curiosity lead us? Yeah. So last night I thought of this, and it kind of, you know, we messaged Greg. We're like, should we talk about this on the podcast? So my question is, is that you look in recent American history, I guess, um, how we have just been such a conservative country, you know, and it's no premarital sex no like you know the puritan emph- uh, like emphasis from the or, you know the mayflower still has lasted to this day exactly you know the calvinist at work ethic and all of that and now you're seeing a very uh liberal society and not just democrats versus republican it is like we've talked about the social justice warriors of there's a hundred and like 472 genders and um <laughs> all of this there are two well, that's two what scoops, they, two genders. Deal with it. <laughs> that's what they claim. But my question <laughs> is: Don't when you read Trump memes, I know people think that you're saying that. Greg. I know. <laughs> Just the, I saw that was the greatest T-shirt I've ever seen. <laughs> two scoops, two genders, and then the uh, the glasses slid over his face. Deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> but my my question is: We're seeing such a because if you think of, a lot of people argue that the baby the baby boomers are what got Trump elected, and that's what took we were progressing so far forward with the election and re-election of Barack Obama and with the baby boomers they took us back a few steps with Trump now when the baby boomers die out and my generation Lord willing Lord willing (laughs) and they're still around (laughs) and my generation is at the top with the way we are now you know being there's 72 genders we should have everything should be legalized um we want complete socialism etc do you think in by the time we're you know 70 80 years old do you think that marriage will be gone, religion will be gone, there's no gender, there's no uh, free will? You know what I'm mean, saying? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, the What's the projection of what the current trends like kind of uh, forecast? Exactly. Like, where does this end? Or is there an end? You mm-hmm. know, I don't, Spangled, is that something you want to start with? Or is that, yeah, go for it. Um, I'll tell you, it's that's really complex. For me, I do very much think that the baby boomers are entire white baby boomers are entirely responsible for Donald Trump's election. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's because culture uh, historically the baby boomers have led like the most awesome world experience that has shaped their entire view of the world, how they think, what the way they were raised. It was right. That's when America was great. Like the the, the very phrase "Make America Great Again" is exactly the perfect thing to pitch to baby boomers who grew up in the perfect era to exactly. ever grow up in America. Like nuclear family. Just kind of move the mic a little bit. Yeah. Um, and the, the reason I say that is, you know, their generation, the quote unquote greatest generation, they defeated Nazism. And so that was sort of the last like ideology that was almost like a cancerous infection on, on the world. Uh, that was so like, you know, American imperialism is real, but Nazism was clearly something radically different, like trying to perfect the human experience with eugenics. Right. Um, and so they grew up, they defeated that. So America was united more than it ever had been. Germany was the only other major global industrial power and supplier for, for goods. So because the United States had this 20 year window, we had decimated Japan with two nuclear you know bombs. Uh, Germany, we had devastated their uh, ability to do manufacturing. England was already crushed because we were so late into the war. So we were really um, 
the world's only supplier of major industrial goods. And that allowed all these baby boomers to remember their, their parents getting to work at union jobs because they could be unions. There's no one else to buy from other than American producers mm -hmm. and get paid ridiculous wages that they could negotiate and get Sorry. all of, like all the benefits, gold plated, um, you know, health insurance that lasted on top of Medicare. And so they remember this era of like 1950s, awesome, like Greece Americanism. Right. And it was white, yeah. and it was a 2.5 kids, white picket fence, suburban right. family. And so that's what they were raised in. Then they start to they get into like their 20s and 30s, and they come into their own and were very idealistic against, because of Vietnam and having to go, and they thought that was such a wrong, you know, just not the right thing to do, and they lost so many friends. That created like an, um, a sense of anti-elitist thought and like academic thought and that you know they're these social planners that know best and so we're going to revolt against them and it even further cemented their distrust in government which kind of led to ronald reagan's arrival after jimmy carter where you know his phrase the most dangerous or the most scary words in the english language are uh, i'm from the government and i'm here to help mm -hmm. and so being hating the government during the 70s because of vietnam 60s and 70s turned into the 80s where all of a sudden the world economy boomed again because of the economic policies so they watched their retirements just skyrocket mm -hmm. like they watched the world economy grow the 90s were fantastic because it was a relatively peaceful period right as they were really hitting late adulthood getting ready to plan for like their retirement and their uh, twilight years and so what we're seeing is as they've started retiring they recognize the society less and less because of all the you know the gender discussion and the cultural change that's happened right and Donald Trump was just the ideal, his message and him being born the very first year of the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. And he just represents the ugly American. Mm -hmm. Like no one has more perfectly embodied what the ugly American is than Donald Trump. Like exactly. he is, he is our son of a bitch. I remember uh, saying when he first announced he was running for president that Donald Trump is the politician that American politics deserves. And, and in a lot of ways, I think that Donald Trump is American culture. He, he represents a significant amount of American culture and that Donald Trump is, he is brash. Brash. He's uh, uh, act arrogant, first, think later. Ar arrogant. Uh, just doesn't isn't considerate of other people's feelings in a lot of ways. He in a, he in so many ways to me represents all the wrong things about American culture, and that's why I think so many of us react to him so negatively. Yeah, I mean he and there had been also too. He is the last of like. That the baby boomers idolize like John Wayne, like the Western cowboy, the rugged individualist that does it on his own. You know, they're yeah. his bootstraps and his bootstraps alone, and no one else helped him even earn a nickel at any point in their life. Yeah, none of that, of course, being true, but that's this narrative baby boomers grew up in, and so of course they want to go back to that era. They grew up, there wasn't a war, we beat everybody, their parents were earning great wages, they had the ideal experience, the institutions were strong because America was united, mm -hmm. and then as they've watched this cultural change, make it great again by going back rather than leading into the future, which is usually what most uh, presidential politics is about, having a plan for where we're going to take it, like Barack Obama, yes we can, you know, looking out into that horizon, crafting the future. Trump totally rejected that. It's he was back, one of the first. and it worked, and it's because of the way where the baby boomers were born, and all the circumstances that crafted white, upper, you know, middle class, lower middle class, and upper middle class baby boomers, what they experienced growing up because of the events surrounding it. Yeah, I mean, culturally, yes. Economically, he represents a time when "Make America Great Again" back when you were earning more money when Muncie. Uh, a city that you live in to go to school, Cat mm -hmm. Muncie was in the '70s and '80s a thriving town. Right, the and ball it's, jars and it's a ghost town now. Harry um, Balls. You know, you have so many <laughs> uh, Indiana towns. We lost almost a million jobs in a state of six million. Uh, we lost seven hundred eighty thousand jobs in the auto industry yeah. when it okay. collapsed. And you're oh, from, you're from the RV Alcar. industry. Yeah, the RV industry. Barack Obama discretionary spoke. income killed that R the RV industry too. It created it, it because was... people would drive around and travel the country because right. they had discretionary income. Then, when it reached a certain plateau in retirement, it was like, well, hell with that. I'm gonna stay at a, a quaint B and B and fly first class. Say, fast forward to now, where comedy clubs are closing for what reason? Primarily because no one goes. Nobody has discretionary income. Yeah, they, it's just too tight. Like any discretionary income is usually a result of credit, like taking on a little bit of debt. 
and and Americans are saving at a faster rate than they've ever saved in, in the last few decades. First, they least. had to deleverage and pay off their debt from the crisis they accumulated, and, and so now we're starting to see like just a bit of savings. Right. So uh, the, uh, many of the comedy clubs, which is hurting the comedy industry, or comedy uh, an industry I work in. Like people are not going to spend the fifty to a hundred dollars to go to a comedy club to see a show when they could just turn on Netflix and order a pizza for l- less than half that and watch a comedy special or one of their favorite shows. Call up a random. Take a well. Take, <laughs> I'm thinking of married couples specifically. Oh, oh. But uh, uh, single people love to spend their discretionary income for the most part. But even I, I, I spend uh, most of my time uh, house sitting my own house. Uh, well, no, well, you have a I shitload know. of expensive equipment in here. I would want to watch over leave. it too. Well, I have cameras, so yeah, it, for the record, yeah. yeah uh, anybody, and the cat won't leave, so it's kind of like having. <laughs> right. a, I got the security, security dog. Yeah. Um, my security, dog, my security pet. <laughs> yeah. Also, it's not. I've decided since I'm a co-host now, it's not the. Uh, it's not Spangle's apartment. It is the We Are Libertarian compound. She's, the compound. The sudden making, command. All of a sudden, she's making decisions, Greg. Oh, she look at that. Said she, I could. She introduced the idea of redecorating the other day. She was like, I don't know if I like those bookshelves. You said that? <laughs> I don't know if those bookshelves. Thought, Check your privilege, hon. If we got black bookshelves to match the curtains, it would look bad. Whatever. Continue. Baby boomers. Bad. <laughs> I'm see, totally joking, by the way. You don't have to get. I yeah. know. Did you We're see the, um, the easel? The, no, the, I didn't. <laughs> read it. I read this. <laughs> Those listening at home. Um, oh, hell yeah. There's a little easel, chalkboard easel a on woke the table. Cafe. Woke cafe. And it says menu, gay frogs, brisket, and tap water. <laughs> um, I just thought that would be perfect for Greg. Why is that? <sighs> well, you like. I only like frogs that aren't gay. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking you like brisket and tap water. Oh, I do. You're I love brisket. Because well, you're American, you get the freedom. fluoride. You get the fluoride in the tap water. Damn right. <laughs> so, so yeah. I mean, if you if you go back, the economics of it are like in Elkhart, there was 28 percent unemployment in 2010, 2011. That was and Barack crippling. Obama uh, spoke at one of the high schools. Yeah, which one did he speak at? Elkhart Concord, Concord. High School. Yeah, Concord. it was. And I was I was young, but it was rough. I saw all of my friends, their parents, who had good jobs, like just lose gone. Yeah. Uh, and one of the unforeseen effects of that was, you know how, like, so most liberal economists say, yeah, these individuals are going to leave the workforce, but in time, if we do a stimulus package, they'll get rehired. Like, right. Because these firms then will have orders, the government will buy from these firms, and these people will go back to work. The problem that no one foresaw was that they were left the workforce at $33 an hour with a pension and with health benefit, you know, benefits. Right. When they re-entered, they came in at like 12 to 14 Mm-hmm. Where the, and a lot of that twelve to fourteen was spent on providing their own health insurance, which is now mandatory. So that just crippled discretionary income for yeah. any kind of entertainment or fun. Yeah, I mean, it, and let's be honest about the 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 healthcare. Uh, Twenty million people aren't going to be uninsured. Twenty million people are making a decision to buy a bad product that they were forced to buy that they didn't want in the first place, right? Correct. And yeah. like, and or it's a situation where the employer decides since they're no longer subject to a fine if they don't provide it. They just aren't going to provide it, and you can go through an exchange. Right. Which you always could, like e-health insurance. You just, right. You know, it wasn't as heavily regulated with, um, you know, oversight on what kind of plans you could and couldn't get. So let's bring it back to uh, the culture. Yeah, where so things are question. going. Where, how do you see it changing? So Let me ask you from your perspective. So that would be of, interesting to me. To reset kind of what she was asking <laughs> is that, you know, you have the baby boomers who are conservative, and our generation is more liberal, and especially... You know, you look at the the LGBT community's expansion of rights. But, with, but keep in mind, baby boomers started out as like anti disestablishmentarianism, like free love army. Right. Tune in, tune out, or something drop out. And so what what Kat was saying is that you you had the baby boomers start at a liberal place, and now they're more conservative. Uh, are will the snowflake generation, and uh, not only us millennials, but the Gen Z, which follow directly behind CAD and nineteen uh, and younger, ninety six, yeah, Na- yeah uh, the Echo millennials, right? So, I mean, do you, what do you think? Do you think that that generation, the people that you're in college with, will end up being more conservative? I mean, here's the thing, and it's because you know i'm in a bubble of ball state university muncie indiana and i'm sure anybody on a college campus can feel like they're in a bubble and that bubble is just not even republican democrat anymore like i said it is just socialism you know is it like so it's just full-on bernie bros everywhere not even bernie bros like they have problems with like they're 
what is it, Karl Marx? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, so they're Marxists. They idolize this guy. And it's just, I personally, with the way the world is going now, the only people who are stopping my generation are the boomy, baby boom, baby boomers. And mm-hmm. when they die out, it's and we're finally in charge and no one's holding us back. I can just imagine the world like having no genders, no marriage, no religion. There's just no institution. No institution. She's, she's she's worried of unfettered socialism, and you know no no power to stop it. And I said I don't I don't think I think that a large part of our society is libertarian, so they're not going to to vote for socialism. We will become more polarized. They are susceptible to that whole. It's the it's the anti corruptive uh, corruption element of. Like that style of messaging that right. they're very susceptible to, even though they're cons- fiscally conservative. Yeah, right. So she's she's concerned about the the, the gas getting stepped on the socialism. I, I mean, do, what, do you think? Do you foresee a future where it where it is that? Do I? Um, I don't think it's a rapid acceleration. Just because, anytime there has there, I mean, I think that there was a brewing uh, movement for democratic social European style welfare. Uh, socialism Mm -hmm. you know that has been around there forever like germany france the idea you know the ideals of people like bernie sanders and the really hardcore progressives in america that has been a brewing sentiment for quite some time right and it's always in like the the idea that bernie sanders is the champion of the working class (laughs) when he's a 75 year old jew from vermont which has 91 percent now what 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 does his religion have to do with it that mind, isn't mind Fuhrer. You wouldn't know. I'm saying a Jewish man, 75 years old, born in the Bronx, like basically Larry David, but right. grumpier and not as funny, <laughs> I, or unironically as funny. Um, he is somebody who, I mean, he he's a senator from a state that is one of the wealthiest in the country. Right, but has like no poverty, and even though they didn't have hardly any poverty, they still couldn't make single payer health care work or their own exchange. Right, like that is that was a billion dollar waste by the state of vermont trying to experiment in the style of government he wants to force upon everybody in america and the thing is a lot of these places that these uh these lifestyle idealism or idealist countries like scandinavia denmark sweden all those areas they all are not they have no ethnic diversity right the united states is the most ethnically diverse right. country in the world for sure period and if you eh, eh, go ahead, no, and that that's the thing is that you talk to guys like Richard Spencer in ethno states, they have no problem with socialism, so long as it's for them, right? They don't have a problem at all with you know Scandinavia and Sweden. That's why he goes over there and speaks there is right. because that in identitarian movement, it isn't about fiscal discipline or or you know uh, social planning for any other area except cultural preservation, right? And so that is something where. In the United States, it would just... The reason there's no gay marriage in California is because the black vote won't ever support it because they're the most homophobic. People always forget that. Mm. That's why it fails every time. Really? Prop 8 fails every single time because the African-American vote says, hashtag no homo, oh hell no. Right. Give me Chris Spangle. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, so it's... We are so diverse, and I there are a lot of... There are a lot of... So many different, like, subcultures that aren't indicative of this sort of loud rabid progressive um rise you know the 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 bernie bro even more like of course bernie bros they don't want to be categorized that's not nearly unique enough for the right. Sure. right i'm different <laughs> if i hear one more person under 25 i'm different i'm special i'm just not I'm, like everybody else. i'm just so random i hate i have something I hate i'm so people. well-rounded and like i don't really have like necessarily habits and interests like i just am interested i just love taylor swift <laughs> yeah, except for this one weird obsession <laughs> I'm just so well read. I've read every book on the New York Times bestseller list. My favorite book is Silence of the Lambs. I own a typewriter. <laughs> I don't know how. I would be really interested to spend time just observing, like just fading into the background and being on your campus and in seeing whether it is really as. Because, like, in my head, the, like the left, the American left, like the militant new left, is an abstraction. Like, I don't really know too many that are actually like it. I just yeah. see people grabbing professors at. Evergreen, you know, at Evergreen State, or I'll show you some Facebook posts after this. That's true, and like, so I, I just, uh, um, one college is a poor sampling, or you know, that's a sample bias or a terrible sampling bias because that's where you're there to learn and like uh, experiment, and everyone Cat. takes these really <laughs> irrational, hardcore fringe beliefs, and then 
Well, they it's change. like an incubator, and then as you as you but by the time you're a senior, you moderate usually, unless you're involved in student government or involved for, in a political organization. Traditionally, you moderate because you get so passionate. It's the first time you're ever learning about it, so you just jump full in, do a deep dive, and then you slowly sort of moderate and modulate back to the norm. So will we see that when 10 years, 20 years down the line when my generation is? Our generation, you Our, ages. You're oh, not sorry, even close. Sorry. She's a. I'm she's technically Gen X, Gen Z, because I was born in 96. Yeah. And the cutoff for millennials is 95. Is but that, it's 95? Yeah. Oh, she's wow. So it's even more millennial. Oh, yeah. She's definitely. Yeah. There's no way that. She wrote a song about Hitler in middle school. She's now. very millennial. Uh, I have never had more letters. Pro for anything. In the I know. Of the I know. Show. Everyone's like, "Keep Cat on. She's great." And I'm like, "Guys, I only had that one song. <laughs> <laughs> like, we, that's all I got." <laughs> she sung. Mom, quit starting sock accounts and messaging. Yeah. I I actually got it on Snapchat. I walked into the green room a couple days ago. Yesterday, hilarious. And she's just singing the Hitler song to one of my coworkers. And they thought it was hilarious. It is hilarious. Yeah, it's great. The, he's been he's been rebranded. But the, the video is up on our YouTube channel if you want to sing. And it's so <laughs> called Tate Off Swiller. It's cute when she sings it because she's just so bubbly and hap- happy so we uh, one of the funniest things greg has ever said is tate off Swif- <laughs> swiftler there's a tate off swiftler t- uh tate off swiftler twitter account or there was and it was just <laughs> it was her superimposed with then on hitler with a little you know the a mustache mo- mustache it's just you it's, found that account <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm account? not saying that i might have the email it's attached to i'm just <laughs> saying <laughs> it's out there right it, it's so funny because she's just so bubbly and happy and like doesn't realize uh I'm singing an educational song. She hasn't I, gotten to Holocaust <laughs> in history class in, in Jewish history at Ball State. <laughs> Not quite yet. So, so your question was what? It's, it's, say that again. Will uh, will the millennials become more conservative? Well, they're definitely. We're seeing data that shows the they're Republican. fiscally conservative because, and it's not for, but they're having some mass collective consciousness or enlightenment about you know the merits of fiscal discipline and like supply side economics or austrian economics Mm -hmm. it's because they feel like they're getting screwed because they're basically paying for the baby boomers and this these generous benefits of the social welfare state knowing full well there it isn't going to be there because of the i mean if you look at the projections right now we're talking about a hundred trillion dollars in uh, unfunded outlays Mm mm-hmm the United, the, the entire world economy, I would doubt, is even remotely close to fifty trillion. Right. So we're talking about one hundred and sixty-nine to one hundred and eighty trillion dollars in future benefits that are owed to people who aren't working, who have the money mm-hmm. because they saved their entire life, mm-hmm. and to their credit, they also supported the people that came before them. They right. didn't have the option of opting out. And so what you end up seeing is when Social Security started after the New Deal, you had 32 to 1. 32 workers supported one retiree, Mm -hmm. one person drawing social uh, welfare insurance. Now it's down to, I think, 5 or 3. It's, I think it's two, almost two. Yeah, it's probably now two. Yeah, it's probably two. And so eventually it'll be 1 to 1. And at that point, how long before there's a social revolution? Right. Especially when these people also have student loan debt. Because that's the other thing. Baby boomers didn't have it because most of them were able to take advantage of the GI Bill or their parents did, and that's what li- made them leap into the upper and middle middle class. Most people don't use the GI Bill that way, even though that's the best tool for social mobility to, to leave the lower classes. But most most people's parents either paid for it or they expected them to pay for it or they just did what all their friends did and didn't work and then loaded up to the hilt with student loans saying oh well, i'll be rich it's inevitable that i'll have a youtube channel and be a millionaire because that's the number one thing kids in the gen z I, that's what they want to be like for us i don't remember like what i said when i was a kid what i wanted to be i wanted to be president i mean <laughs> we were told each one of us was you're going almost to be. there thank you <laughs> you're president of all libertarians that is true it's nothing Wait, to you're something at. better than a president you're the dearest of pure. all leaders that's damn right that's real power mm-hmm. dearest of all leaders the the other thing that we are doing in America it, it currently is creating a class system, and w- what you ha- think so? What well, what's happening is because we are squeezing out the ability for millennials and Gen Z to be entrepreneurs and build their own wealth. That's the killer. You are you are uh, you uh, baby boomers won't leave the workforce. They're hoarding their money. Why won't they give me some of their money? Uh, baby boomers are are going to – essentially what happened is when you remove entrepreneurship from generations, you create class systems. Mm-hmm. Because what happens is new wealth isn't created. and New opportunity. New, new opportunity industry. isn't created. 
And so what happens is that wealth just gets transferred familial. Fa- Interfamilially. Through, interfamilially. Thank you. And so you end up with a class system over time because that wealth isn't being it isn't being distributed because new entrepreneurs aren't being created. Though they can because they have to service their debt they took on to go to college and right. learn. And that's the other thing too is it used. I mean, the closest thing to a national religion in the United States I've always said is higher education. Right. Education is the answer, the be all, end all. You can never cut funding for it. Heaven, for, you know, it's you are. You are un-American if you're, you know, say that maybe we shouldn't spend as much on education, or maybe right. you shouldn't go to college. Like you're a heretic. Peter Thiel is absolutely scorched for saying that. Hey, I'll give you two hundred thousand dollars if you drop out of college and start a, do a startup. And then you can always go back because right. it's not like he says, you know, he says just take a sabbatical and if it doesn't work out, go back to Stanford. Right. Or uh, fracking in North North Dakota. Is that where it is? Yeah. Yeah. Those people out there getting paid so much money yeah and i mean that's that's a boom and those see like that kind of opportunity is what the baby boomers parents were able to build their lives on and right. it was a continued boom and it lasted really until the one bad thing of reaganomics was that um and this is kind of wonky but at the end of the day like once you take like he uh, we had inflation under jimmy carter right and the thought was for john john Keynes, like if you take economics general theory his you know, quintessential book that defined most of the 90 or the 1900s for economic thought. It was the idea that you could either have full employment and settle with high inflation, or you could have low inflation and low employment. Right. And what happened is that ended up failing because you had stagflation under Jimmy Carter, which really hit the baby boomers parents a lot, Mm -hmm. but because they were savers and remembered the uh, parent, their parents being in the depression, they weathered the storm pretty well. Right. Now to get out of stagflation, what was co- what was necessary is the United States was a slowing in productivity because Japan was all of a sudden a major industrial power. Germany had rebuilt. Europe had been able to. Uh, a lot of developing countries could do. You know, like Mexico could do mass production right. on demand. And so what ended up happening is money always flows to where labor is cheap. Mm-hmm. That's and it's going to happen every single time. And in the United States, labor wasn't cheap anymore. What, but because of the stagflation, though, we had to encourage investment, and the only way to encourage investment is to tighten the monetary, the money supply, yeah. which draws inflation out as well. But then the tax cuts were to gain productivity, so people would work more. Because uh-huh. of all the union, you know, laws, people had gotten used to a, a shorter work week, not you know, forty years mandatory, um, OSHA, you know, requirements. And so what our Laffer discovered is that if you cut it at the margin. Where if you cut taxes, where for each additional dollar you make, you get to make keep more of it rather mm-hmm. than less in a progressive system, you get a huge productivity surge. And that's what fueled the 1990s. All of a sudden, weak monetary policy, flood the United States got flooded by Japan. There was even like a Japan worry of takeover, so they're buying oh, yeah. all the real estate. Well, I watched the movie Gung Ho. It's a great movie. Exactly. And so because we did that, it also meant all of a sudden that all the products that were manufactured in the United States – because our dollar was stronger, now was more expensive for the rest of the world to buy. Right. So it exacerbated the problem of hollowing out manufacturing. Uh-huh. And so then you saw um, a lot of people just – really, you saw a lot of bankruptcy, and you saw uh, a real estate boom is what it ultimately resulted in, a flood of real estate speculation that ended in Black Friday, the uh, savings and loans crisis of the 1980s. Right. But it's, uh, I, don't, I guess – like entrepreneurship is what fuels everything and really the united states is simply where we are right now and what our future looks like is where japan just spent the last 20 years yeah we are a carbon copy economically we're sort of a zombie economy like we'll have one percent growth best like in during booms that are probably irrationally exuberant like the mortgage crisis probably two to three percent then you'll have a a recession but we'll just sort of zombie along around one percent and stagnate so uh, the unless all of a sudden entrepreneurship's just a new a whole new um industry arrives. Right. And that's really something that Trump was elected on is is re rebuild the notion that entrepreneurship exists. And I he think, is one. I think that it will be mm-hmm. a huge I mean, I remember my dad growing up had the art of the deal and my dad owned his own small business. Just and, like you, a signed first edition. A signed first edition. <laughs> And I, I really think that a lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners wanted to be Donald Trump in the 80s. Oh, he the, was he was Gordon Gecko, but in real life. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so I think... Do you think, know who that is? Uh, is it a lizard? It's <laughs> Michael Douglas in the movie Wall Street with Charlie Sheen. 
We'll, we'll, oh. we'll show it to you and get you woke. The Wolf of Wall Street? No. That's no, but so, uh, so you've seen that? No. It's inappropriate. <laughs> She's a sheltered kid. She was driving 55 on the interstate. She won't. I was following him and I was going like 70. She was, Did you? Oh, so. Okay. She would not go over 55 because her dad told her not to. Yeah. What's wrong with that? I, I respect my my parents and I'm a millennial. Really? Mm-hmm. You're not a millennial. Don't you dare self-identify as one of us. But I'm a, I don't know what I am. You're <laughs> you're a millennial. I know you're one year outside of it. You're a Gen Z. So <sighs> the, Zier. uh, Greg's, Greg, <laughs> Greg and Chris. So much for the nap. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she chokes me out all the time. <laughs> yeah. No, not like in a dirty way. Um, <laughs> not, what I meant. not in a Google search way. No, she she fake- not in I just sucked a black dick way. <laughs> yeah, she oh fake God. choked me the other day. Uh, in front wow. Of, so we were standing here, and she goes, "Shut up!" And she like tried to choke me, and and had her hand around my neck. And then he put his, and, and we so, were like, "So I I jokingly did it back to her, and we look out, and my neighbors looking <laughs> in the window as we're choking each other out like a couple of domestic violence patients." Want to run for governor? This yeah, uh, this was this was last Thursday before God, the show. It was so funny, so insignificant in the life of Chris and Cat that we uh, the daily the, ongoings. Oh uh, uh, my! Some of our coworkers are ready to kill us. Why? Uh, because just because uh, there's constant laughing, we're always in there. Like, the number of insights. Because we're having jokes. fun, we're doing work, and are you at that level where you don't even need to communicate? You can just with a look. Oh yeah, and yeah. you both know. Oh yeah, yeah. Absolutely. This is how we communicate. Beep bop. No 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 no. That's racist. <laughs> no, actually, what that was. The Tootsies would be so. Offended. Actually, what that was was a slam poetry bit. Uh-oh. Beep bop. Nanu nanu. What does that mean? Millennials glued to our phones. Whispers. America! America! <laughs> what is that from? I, was sla- I just made it up. It was some slam poetry yeah, yeah. about how Spangle and I communicate with texting because with we're millennials bop. and we don't know how to communicate face to face. It's Carry awkward, on, so we just look down and then text each other, sitting in each other's presence. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, you up? Sharing memes. <laughs> yeah. No. Huh. I c- I That's taking, s- telling you would take so much time. I'll just send you this meme. S- some of our coworkers are also getting very paranoid about the fact that we th- they think we're talking about them <laughs> when we're in the same room. Yeah, I would go ahead and bet that is yeah. not totally unjustified. Wow. Uh, I'm a child of God. Uh, yes, we love Jesus. But from now on, a new bit we're going to have on this show. I'm. Look at me just... Just creating everything. Crafting content. Get rid of the um, Moving autism. Moving on up. Moving on up. Forget about the autism. Uh, I'm going to have a slam poetry session. Are you? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the She calls the, the policy and philosophy portion, the politics of the show, everything after the first 20 minutes, exclusively it's autism. It's mm-hmm. just how we, started, kind of is. how we started referring to it. Yeah, it's so funny. Like with the straight face, if you heard us talking like at the grocery store, we're like, yeah, so then Greg will do the autism. And then I don't know if I have <laughs> much contribution you know to the autism. But I mean, the autism is just great. And everyone's like. The well, it's gone mainstream because I was listening to POTUS politics last week, and some New Yorker reporter was like, you know, and it got a little autistic there in the middle, and I was like, "That's us! It's catching on! It is! It really! It's I mean, spreading! It, it honestly is! That's I that! Yeah, I, I know caught that. your autism, but for Taylor Swift, <laughs> it's contagious. Yeah. yeah, I know, and it's it's endearing. We love our artistic friends, oh, and no, our I mean, Asperger's friends. I think though we do, we definitely talk about it in a more in depth and comprehensive perspective than you're going to get, and we're also way less um, partisan, so we'll look yeah. at the full. Sp- Full spectrum, uh, <laughs> if you will. Uh, Jokes. Yeah, of, of the the topic from all sides. And the cultural change, I, don't you think, I'm a big bl- proponent that all, everything is a cycle. Like, so there, it's a wave, it ebbs and flows. Yeah. And so all this cultural Marxism is what I would call it. Because yes. that's what it really is, is it's the trying to completely eliminate any type of institution that exists for which people are beholden and not open to like the um, best thinking of the elites in academia. Yeah, which is really kind of where we are. Well, you look you look at the early you know you look at Teddy Roosevelt and the election of 1912. You, Eugene Debs, you had a very socialistic uh, worldview at work. That Jack that Reed ele- left uh, the United States to go live in Russia to go through the experiment with Lenin. Yeah, I mean, you had uh, Woodrow Wilson get elected, and then you get to the 20s, and you have Calvin Coolidge. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then you go to FDR. Do no harm, president. Exactly. And then you go to Eisenhower, and then you go to Kennedy, who was fairly conservative. But then you oh, end today, up with- Kennedy would be the most radical... <laughs> 
he would be called a libertarian because of the his civil rights support, right. his non-interventionism, and then his extreme tax cutting. And uh, also that whole bit about uh, the secret society speech. Yeah. <laughs> the full Alex Jones speech. The truth. Yeah. The, the, he's full I will of, bash them in, or uh, smash them into a million pieces uh, yeah. and just, you know, throw them into the wind. Ah. Uh, I... I I, on the uh, way to work the other day, I was uh, – she's – Quoting Alex Jones. She was – well, she went to a uh, – I saw Chloe the other day, and uh-huh. so she stayed with Chloe, and then I, I picked her up on the way to work. And on the way to, so kind. He provides transportation. And so we were uh, – <laughs> we, we were talking about something. She was talking about Taylor Swift. And then I go, oh, that's where Bobby Kennedy spoke. Have you ever heard the speech? And then I, I like six minutes of Bobby Kennedy speaking after King got assassinated. She's like, I don't know if you were actually fascinated or if you were just like, this is fascinating. Well, no, the, I was. It was cool. Well, you should. Because, I mean, Bobby Kennedy is Roman Catholic. And so he specifically asked there a replacement for the CIA uh, after Dulles if um, – if the who was if the CIA or any of the deep state had any role in killing his brother, mm. and he asked him in a way only a ro- if, if they lie they go to immediately to hell. They believe really, it. and so that's specifically why he asked him that way on a private line. Interesting. And that'll and did he co- answer? I don't, the rest of the uh, files will come out this um, th- this year. It's eligible to be released. Ooh, we're gonna get so. Let's woke. have a let's have a launch party. We'll live stream. Oh yes. yeah. The review. Uh, so we can sit here and just weaponize autism, JFK. <laughs> you know, and then you had, uh, you, so you have these waves, and right now we're in a more liberal wave where you have a Nixon who, you go from an LBJ president who did the Great Society in like an Obama to a more liberal president who's a Nixon, and then eventually that'll swing back more to a conservative president like a Reagan. Nixon was a lot like FDR. Like he was very much right. a social planner. We already know what the best minds think. This is what we're going to do. Don't worry about it, you little people. So so we will swing back, but I do fear that the lack of entrepreneurship in – there is still entrepreneurship in the millennial generation. It's YouTube. It's just – yeah, it's just, it's in the internet it, industry. But it's not industry creating. But it's no. – it, well, I mean, you could argue that the internet is – Oh, that but that wasn't that's an industry that's really sort of um, matured. I sure. mean, there aren't going to be a ton of Facebooks. there's going to be huge, huge dri- drivers of job growth because, like, we know that all new job net job creation in the United States comes from companies that are under the age of five. So every single net job added comes fr- from a uh, a company that was under the age of five, and it isn't small business. That's like a misconception. It has nothing to do with like your small businessman that starts up a one man shop and is really self employed but has an LLC. Right. right. All job creation comes from high potential firms that get massive investment and are under the age of five, and then take like like Facebook, like um, uh, Tesla, like SpaceX, these companies that are very very young but then scaled up in our rapid growth uh, companies but the internet was an infrastructure play and none of the productivity gains came right so really you're looking at did the did it have an effect yes huge effect but on productivity nothing's changed because it's so damn complicated to use right all the like the productivity gains people exper- want, thought we would experience didn't arrive the hairy price and now we're even more distracted yeah that's uh, the other reason yeah. And I, I would it hasn't made doing jobs easier. Entrepreneurship also breeds more conservative outlooks and oh. uh, fiscally and uh, socially. Our friend that uh, went and got accredited and tried to advert, like get a, a sign out in front of her establishment. Oh, yeah. She just went, took the class, spent the money, was going to put up a class, then realized she needed a permit. She is hardcore anarchist after one experience yeah. about trying to get a permit. This is a, a, an anesthetician who runs her own Small Shop. business, do it. She, she it's self employment, really. She rents a chair. She's part of the gig economy, essentially. Right. And uh, she cannot, she is just sitting here going, the amount of bullshit that I have to go through with the city, the state, the federal government, the taxes, the permits, <laughs> all this is outrageous. The accreditation. I, I'm barely making any money. And then I want to put a sign out to advertise. And she can't. It's a crime. It's a crime. Or a civil, you know, violates a civil ordinance. And so somebody who was not political is now like, what's the download for We Are Libertarians? What's yeah. the website? How do I Give me some Spooner. It? Right. <laughs> I want some Murray Rothbard, please. Damn right. Um, we got to burn down the government. <laughs> right. She's watching V for Vendetta right now. Damn right. Uh, so woke. Yeah. So so I, I got to tell you... Um, what? Nothing. <laughs> what? Just keep talking. Also, in the last segment, that chewing that you heard was cat eating. I was chips. chewing off of the camera. 
Sort of. I heard it. Oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> hey. Um, Tell me what this looks like. That's her fidget spinner. It's uh, That's a vagina. <laughs> I didn't even mean to make sure that. Sure did make a vagina. <laughs> just stretching the What's that say about your subconscious? Uh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I've been out it. <laughs> <laughs> if you um, want to know what your heart truly wants, watch where it wanders. <laughs> Why did I just make a big black dick? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Why did I search that just out of the blue? What impact do you th- th- do you think the gig economy makes on on society moving forward and and productivity how big is the gig economy i think a a lot of i I mean that's a tough thing to say too because at the end of the day people are going to need you're going to need to plan for retirement at a certain point right the gig economy doesn't lend itself well to that you know baby boomers and then their parents had it so lucky in that you know they had defined benefits they worked at a place their company had to you know, contribute because of the union negotiation, it was there without much headache or like right. without much putting much headache or planning in. Now everything in the gig economy is on the individual. Right. And while libertarians would say that's awesome, you know, yeah. there's also the likelihood that it appears to be happening is that no one's planning. Mm-hmm. And then that doesn't mean though you don't get a Great Depression situation where no one planned, no one has anything available. At the end of the day, the government's going to step in and intervene in that 100% right. of the time, every time, because people don't want to watch suffering. And then you end up with a universal basic, basic income. Bingo. Which is a lot of what tech, the tech people in San Francisco are like, listen, AI and robotics are going to put a lot of people out of work. What happens when you don't when human labor is inefficient? Right. Why, and, why would you Im- encourage inefficient labor and productivity? Right. Because, you know, the more productive you can make things, that's where we get our lifestyle gains. That's why someone today who is classified as in deep poverty in the united states has an iphone mm-hmm. it's that productivity allowed um the ability to do mass production global supply chains has given them a quality of life from the productivity gains so much higher than the best kings from even you know 50 years ago right as far as trends though i don't see us turning into a, a society of snowflakes do you i think it's i see it because that's the they're that bad Ninety percent of because Ball State's a conservative campus, considered like oh. from a perspective of the rest of right. the cl- sure. you know, colleges in the United States. No, it's ninety-five percent of the people I'm around are like that, and so that's what makes. Me and you're in Greek life, which is way less radical liberal All traditionally right, than. We'll give it eighty percent. No, but I'm saying like that's saying something because in Greek life, people are way more traditional. Like they love institutions clearly. So, like, they're usually way more conservative than the rest of the hardcore radicals. Well, and the interesting thing is, is that I think it kind of goes back to society is things are shifting. There are a lot of, uh, usually, you know, there's sororities, fraternities for specifically black people, for Asians, for Hispanics, whatever. Segregated Greek housing. Right, right. Now it's, it's changing. There's a, there are in... Like we have a girl, we have a few girls in our sorority who are actual lesbians, and there's a ton of gay guys in chapters that you, you know 20 years it. ago that wouldn't be a thing, and they're loved just the same. So I think it's just a societal thing now. That more cultural acceptance of alternative lifestyles. Exactly, and so me seeing these. That's shocking. So a lot of fraternities are totally cool with it. Yeah. Because I had a gay fraternity brother, and he wouldn't have dared. Really. Dared. Dared what? To come out of the closet then. Oh, no. Really? I mean, there's a few chapters who are... Well, you were also in Texas. Right. Right. You know, at the most conservative school in the state. And again, right. I'm in Indiana, like, you know. Right. In Muncie. In Muncie, but... Muncie. Uh, there are home, a couple... Home of, home of the hangings back in the 20s. <laughs> yeah. Oh. No, but there there are uh, a lot of chapters that have open or out people. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean... And it's... Interesting. Like, And, like, and that's great. I also, though, because like a lot of times we define ourselves through the roles we have, right? So like in Greek life, it's all I'm Greek or I'm, you know, an alpha. Mm-hmm. What what are you? I don't want to say I'm alpha omega move. Well, they already promoted it's you singing your Hitler song on Twitter. It's true. We're so proud. They clearly didn't watch the clip. They did not watch the clip. We're and so we're not proud of our sister that just. The one time I was validated. <laughs> we're not taking this away from me. I know. Like, oh, <laughs> what a thing to be validated for. Uh, no, AOPI. AOPI. That's right. AOPI. So alpha omicron pi. Like, you guys clearly have a set of, like, assumed roles that people already can sort of get the gist, or they impact, uh, project on you before ever even meeting you. Like, yeah. you have a stereotype, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. Every, Every, everyone does. Yeah. I can't imagine institutions getting to the point where they're so sort of... Uh, open? 
or yeah, they're, they're they're so undefined and so trans like sort of transient and you you know they don't they don't have a stereotype. It would be shocking to me if that was something that would to were to arrive because the human experience is finding the roles that you're comfortable with, with the people you're comfortable with, and then and finding patterns and like exactly likeness. discovering right. patterns and then discovering what you like, and so much uh, social acceptance almost entirely in the United States is based upon employment. Mm -hmm. Whereas though, like during college and your formative years, it's very much around like the social activities. Right. And so in all of those carry with them further definitions. And so I can't see all of a sudden there being this just entire dismissal of individual identity, which we, you know, kind of craft for ourselves. Well, like I said, uh, my one of my first episodes on is now a lot of sororities are accepting trans people. Mm -hmm. And it's just, a, you know, it's just opening the door for um, just the breaking down of the Yeah, any type of, any type of, you know, clearly defined uh, distinction. Is just going away. Gone. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, but I'm just saying what is the world going to look like when How does that ex how does that come or you know continue on? Cuz you think of traditional American life, not even traditional American life, but we'll take it a step further to uh, or step backwards to human life. I learned about this in my sociology classes. You know, humans like to have, you know, they have to have a home. They have to have family to reproduce. They have to have some kind of work. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. Yeah. And um, you have to have, a lot of times, they need a sense of spiritual slash um, Yeah, once you satisfy lower needs. Emotional, like, so that's why humans have created religion. Right. That's or, why Marx said, you know, did God create man or did man create God? Exactly. And so that... Oh, deep, Marx. Deep, you deep. Got him. Wizard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Harry Potter. No. But with that, it's like, is it going to go, like, how far can we go if we, you know, either get rid of religion because it's, you know, um, not accepting of every kind of person. Or A barbarous relic. Exactly. So you get rid of religion. You get rid of marriage because, you know, why should we only be bound to one person? I don't foresee marriage anybody? because that is tradition. That is an economic institution and always has been. And they're preaching that. So I'm thinking, will they change it? Because already look on TV. There's TV shows about, uh, th <laughs> I think the name's funny, thruples. Like three. That's the term? Yeah. Yeah. It's a group of three, thruple. Like man, like dad, mom, mom, like or dad, dad, mom. Or but whatever. one of them is losing out on property rights because they don't have legal standing. Interesting. You know, in the event of a split, they wouldn't have legal standing um, right. that the 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 actual sanctioned spouse would. With our economic system now, but it's like, will it will it adapt to? We'll have no religion. We'll have socialism. Everything. Um, no institutions anymore. And there's a way to combat that. I think we'll have institutions. Economic. They just will avoid any type of stereotype or any type of anything yeah. that can be negatively reflect. That'll be a negative reflection of this group and this societal trend. Maybe if we had the Ministry of Truth, you know, to, and we had the Ministry of War or Peace, you know, and the, that would be an idea. <laughs> How about instead of a Secretary of everybody had War, have a, a Secretary of Peace? Tell a screen in their house that monitored everything. You know, a smart home like right. Elon Musk is pitching. Right, right. right. like eight, 1984. I'm reading 1984 right now, and man, does everybody need to go read Orwell? A a Animal Farm, yes, but 1984 especially. Talk about accurate social commentary. Oh, the Orwell, man, what a genius that guy was. And I don't think we're that far. Uh -uh. You yeah. know. No, you still have a lot of freedom in America. You still have the ability to choose what you want to do. You have you have in the United States government a lot of nudges. Right. But, That's the rising trend. Right. Nudges, but you, you know, like marriage because the three of us are not married, we have 1100 less tax breaks than a married listeners. Oh, right. And so we have a lot of nudges, but in reality, you have the freedom. Where do you, where do you want to eat? What's you know what store do you want to go shop at? What what gives my life meaning, and what, what am I going to pursue? What path do I want to choose? What do I want to read? What you know, you, if you want to start a an outlet that tells people a different point of view, start a podcast called We Are Libertarians. You can, and nobody's standing outside the door. We have a lot of freedom in America, and a lot of times we lose sight of that. Completely. We get, right. become obsessed about about the slightest infringement yes. or perceived infringement. But good. We should. We, we should. should. Absolutely. Which I think speaks to sort of our innate um, characteristics or like 
because I very much believe that like imprinted on the American soul because of our revolutionary mythology, it, which is true. But I mean, I'm saying that's sort of our creation myth is that, you know, to hell with the taxes King George wants to levy. Right. Even though we would have been better off taking those very small levies, we're going to do it on our own, even if it's tougher. That's just something imprinted upon the spirit and right. then passed down um, as a behavior or like a a, a mass identity. But like, do you think it's being passed down to my generation? I don't know. Is it everything. not? Like, what do you remember about the revolution? Like. What were you taught? Which revolution? The American Oh, um, the witch revolution. Well, the all French of history revolution. began on July 4, 1776. <laughs> exactly. Everything right. before that was a mistake. Well, uh, we learned that we left England because, or Great Britain, whatever, because they were telling us what to do and we wanted all kinds of freedoms, including religious freedom. And we that isn't why religious freedom is why are why the pilgrims came on the Mayflower, you know, right? That's that religious freedom. So we revolted over taxation. Oh, yeah, like the Boston Tea Party. Yeah, and the, and oh. the Stamp Act. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were basically... They made shitty tea and they wanted us to use it. <laughs> right. They were teabagging us. We make the best tea. Everybody tells us we are the best teabaggers. Well, right. well, 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 essentially what happened is the Crown was raising money and they passed the, the like tea Like ridiculous tax. And then they sent the tea over here and said, pay up. And they were like, we don't want this tea. Mm -hmm. You can't force us to take this tea. And they were, you know, that's... So what we've learned is... Okay, yeah, I was getting that confused. But what we learned was... No, I mean, and that's totally... Like, I get it. Because I would imagine that you are purposely not taught it. Because, like, people in our generation don't know it well. And I don't know how our history teachers would have any idea how to tell it correctly right, right. and it, what we for the, about the boston tea party is great britain was taxing us a ridiculous amount and telling us what to do and pushing us around and they had their sh soldiers living in our houses and that's what what a, i don't remember the third the third amendment was no, about fourth amendment for a fourth amendment third. third is the one that nobody talks about because oh the, the quartering yeah the quartering because yeah. like if a soldier came yeah right in right. the general writ right so um so yeah that's what we learned about and that's why we revolted against a rebellion rebel because we didn't have representation did they teach you though that we actually had a option like so a agreement was brokered that would have been less financially uh less of an imposition financially from a form of taxation but we wouldn't receive um representation and so we would have been better off economically like all the merchant class would have had we taken it and stayed with the uh, great britain or great britain was really the british empire and we would have ended probably up like canada they're, st they're the secretary or their head of state is still the queen. Yeah. To this day, the queen of England is the sec the head of state. Our our secretary of state, their version is the queen of England in they Canada. They still have to get permission from the queen to do certain things. The, we we offered, offered them statehood and they rejected it. That's why I hate Canadians. Yep. There's 98 percent of them live on the border, Greg. That's right. What are they up to? Wait, do they really? Yes. Oh yeah. You, oh, yeah, you missed the early years of wall. We had this. Oh. Cause we hated would, Canadians. Well, because who would, if you think about it, who would live all the way up north, like with the Eskimos and right? Who would reject American statehood? Look at Puerto Rico; they would do anything for statehood. They would, they would do anything, including send us Joe Ruiz and Aria Torres. That's true. <laughs> right. Well, we learned in one of my classes about how we always talk about mass um, immigration is, you know, the southern border. But apparently, we learned in class um, a lot of Canadian women fl flood to the country um when Sluts. they're pregnant mm -hmm. to give birth here oh yeah anchor babies and then they go back right every time because it's better here i guess it's cheaper that's uh, ted cruz really rafael theodore cruz wow interesting mm -hmm. lion ted lion ted he's lion the zodiac ted. killer he is the zodiac killer and his dad <laughs> killed jfk he did right donald trump told me <laughs> god emperor told me that is <laughs> every time <laughs> I get sad. I think about Donald Trump as president, and it's, it's so the best funny. day ever. Immediately, uh, it, like your fake news. I just watched that clip of him in that first press conference, and laugh. He began his first press conference as president of the United States after not doing one for months, and read a list of all he had accomplished in his short tenure and how he was the most productive president thus far in history. <laughs> Then proceeded to do a press conference. Did you see the, the tweet? The balls that takes. The tweet today? To who? M M Brzezinski? <laughs> oh, yeah. She was bleeding. She had a, a facelift, <laughs> and it was disgusting. She was bleeding all over the place. L let me read. After he offered to officiate their wedding. Let me read Joe. the tweet. Uh, I, hopefully he didn't delete it because it's so funny. Uh, so Donald Trump tweeted today, I heard poorly rated Morning Joe speaks badly of me. Don't watch anymore. <laughs> then how come low IQ crazy Mika, along with Psycho Joe, 
came to Mar-a-Lago three nights in a row around New Year's Eve and insisted on joining me. She was bleeding badly from a facelift. I have never seen a woman swoon harder over a man than Mika Brzezinski to Donald Trump. I I said no. Are you kidding? Really? There's a video. Go to look it up. Mika Brzezinski, Donald Trump YouTube video, and she, he like picks her up when he's going on to do a morning interview during the campaign. Oh, he and Joe were great friends, and you know he yeah. It's uh. That's the thing is people just can't handle it that it's. They've known him personally on an individual basis for so long, and they're like, holy sh... Like, it's so funny to watch how many people have disavowed him that had personal relationships with him. Trump? Mm-hmm. Wow. To me, I mean, if you think about it, you, you're talking about... Like, so Joe Scarborough, you know, former uh, congressman from Pennsylvania, at the time a rising Republican rock star, host of Morning Joe on MSNBC, getting married to Mika Brzezinski, and these people have loved Trump, are members at his Mar-a-Lago resort, pay like $125,000 just to join and have been lifelong, you know, acquainted with him for a lifetime, and all of a sudden he dis- becomes president, and it is outright disavowal, like he's going to ruin America. And, like, that's something, that's a shocking turn of turn of events but, for someone that you've known for so long. But is it because, I'm telling you now, the persecution people feel, uh, fear? Just yeah. being on a college campus, I mean, if... Like they I thought said, Trump was Hitler. Yeah, if you say you're a Republican, you're you're. Yeah, you tell people you're a libertarian, yeah. so so don't get beat up. No, I'm a libertarian now. The three best friends, the three <laughs> best friends, the gang's all here. Oh boy, <laughs> but, this is a lot to take in. So I, I didn't realize this was so like yep. it's it's very real. It mm-hmm. was surreal when you announced. Now I'm right. very much like dealing with the realities of exactly, this yes. new arrangement. Kind of like some selection. Yeah? I kind of feel like <laughs> this is an infiltration. <laughs> I know. I weaseled my way in. And I feel I like the Greeks have like so, <laughs> slowly, you know. We were, hey, we're with enslaved for thousands of years. We're on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so how much Greek history do you know? Do you know? Um, how Greek is your family? Very Greek. My dad is a first generation American. Is he really? Yeah. Both my grandparents were born and raised in Greece and then moved when they were like 25. To immigrated here? Yep. Immigrated here. Got married. Um, what brought him here? Well, my long story short, but I think it was to flee the aftermath of World War II. Mm-hmm. But my unc- my grandfather's uh, uncle was the first to come to America and he Meant to go to Chicago, came through Ellis Island, meant to go to Chicago, ran out of money halfway through, ended up in Elkhart, Indiana. No so, kidding. Which if you look at a map, it's right on the way. Right on the way. What is that? US 41 or mm-hmm. something like that? Yeah. And so he just started up in the RV industry and then my grandpa. He had no money. He and ran out, but, but he thought he would have And was enough. he married? Nope. Single. Single, Single in a, yeah. runs out of money, yep. no social welfare states, no benefits that he was allowed Starts to use Starts working, yet. grunt, shining shoes. Does what you that. would think, like, oh, I'll find a way to support myself. And ends up uh, owning his own um, pool tables store. Billiard and, store. Billiard store. And then my grandpa comes along when he's 20, I don't remember how old he was, 20 something. Starts working there, works his way up, becomes the owner. Grows it further. And now my uh, grandpa, my uncles, my dad, they have... A bar, a restaurant, the billiard store still, and my dad has his own business. So it's really the American dream. It really is. I mean, and that's that was what the story of America was. You mm-hmm. know, and the story of America it. isn't like clearly for my people. It wasn't so great. You whiteies kind of ruined things for us. Right, right. You know, took our land. Well, and it's Drunks? interesting. <laughs> you gave us casinos, okay? Oh, I know. And in, free oh, college, in, if you can yeah, prove okay. it. You gave us casinos, and you gave us you know these camps, these <laughs> these chain link fenced camps in Oklahoma. Thanks. <laughs> really appreciate it. No, but it's I want to go to Tulsa on my chain link fence property. Cat and I were talking yesterday about how much we loved summer camp. Oh yeah. We gave you a summer camp. Yeah, a constant yeah. camp with a, with a the, stipend. The thanks we get. Yeah. yeah Diabetes and alcoholism as well. Uh, no, but my uh, and then my grandma, her and her sisters moved to Canada, mm-hmm. and then she was like, "Oh, I'm looking for a husband," and my grandpa told his uncle, "I want a wife." So they got. It's kind of an arranged marriage, but which usually la- now or it's showing last end up, you know, they're still being able to stand to it. Yeah, day, like they married. last longer than oh yeah, voluntary choice, which is pretty there's something really interesting in that. Very interesting, and they're still married today, fifty over fifty years, and yeah. so she moved to the U.S. They got married and had my dad and then my two uncles, and they were here for so long they became U.S. citizens, mm-hmm. and. It's interesting. Fully naturalized. Yeah, fully naturalized. U.S. citizens, they vote all the time, everything. And my uncles, or it was funny, my grandpa told my grandma when they got here, I'll work 
I'll take care of everything. You just stay here and you know cook, clean, whatever. Sexist. Not splitting but, the duties. Well, but here's what he no, said. No, 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 no. That's patriarchy. No, but what he said was. If she doesn't want to do it. Right. And he said, don't, you don't need to worry about finding a job. I'll do it. You don't need to worry about getting your driver's license because it's difficult. We don't really know English. I'll do it. So we did it all. And my grandma was like, well, I'm really bored. So she got a job at a tailor. She started seamstress. tailoring. Seamstress. And she got her driver's license. Heck yeah. So I'm like, where to go, Yaya? What she do? Her name's Yaya? Well, that's grandma in Greek. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yaya and Agnes. Mm-hmm. Yaya and Agnes. And now they've lived in their house so long. They own it. Got their own businesses. and They are, you know, very much what that embodies what, you know, the American experience. But i tell you what, like that isn't even, one, our immigration rates are so low now, obviously, especially post, you know, post Trump. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but there, that isn't, the American dream isn't anymore to like start your own, sh- you know, main street sh- storefront. Sure. Have your son, you know, raise your sons to turn it into, build it up and turn it into a franchise or, you know, a conglomerate and then sell out or whatever. Now, we just we were valuing some really long things like Gen Z. Their number one response for what do you want you want to be when you grow up is famous. That's the number not astronaut, not entrepreneur, not doctor. Literally just thinking of She's myself. D- uh, literally Yikes. looking at herself. Hitting a little close to home. No, I'm looking. <laughs> Ooh, I'm comfortable. How many views are? I'm going to change my response if we don't have enough views. That's what she's <laughs> calculating right now. <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's that's a really stunning trend because yeah. that, it has always been a career, um, a productive like contribution from you know, like a productive member of society. What values added by fame by a celebrity? You know, and what does that say about that? Like, what is that? What does that turn into? I think part of it is uh, our generation's lazy, and they see the rich. And here, here's what it is: is I grew up with TVs like MTV Cribs mm-hmm. and Keeping Up with the Kardashians right when it first started, and you see these lavish, ridiculous lifestyles, like McMansions and McMansion, McMansions. You see the way these people live, and it's like, well, I want that. And so some people do. And what did it take for Kim Kardashian to get it? Fame is a business model. Like it very Absolutely. much. Like Donald Trump, he turned his name like because he pulled off a couple. He re- rebuilt Manhattan when no one else. It was all porn shops and dilapidated. But because of that, he was able to turn his last name into a licensed premium brand mm-hmm. that business- people would pay would pay ridic- t- terrible terms, like extortionary amounts per <laughs> you know like uh, royalties and and um, per fee sales stipend back to him just to be able to say that it's a trump brand yeah and that he's president that is only going to exponentially increase well Mm -hmm. and then and i've long said that as i've kind of grown up and as i've started working and doing consulting on the side like i'll do small business or medium-sized business we had a tech guy that was he called you the when i was we were going out to do that guy um that i was on with goes is like that's local celebrity is that local celebrity chris yeah the unofficial mayor of indianapolis yeah he yeah. just said that? Swear to God. And put it in tweets and stuff. Yeah. I didn't Local see that. Local celebrity Chris Bangle. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, no, like, as I've gone around doing some s- consulting, like, you realize how full of bullshit... Please don't do that. How full of bullshit Sorry. the entire world is. Like, how fragile the entire economy is and how it is just all oh. bullshit. <laughs> she... Okay. I'm sorry. That was a really good thought. Kat, Kat Keep and, going with it. Kat sorry. and I are, are well, she fidgety. She needs a fidget spinner. So we have this fidget putty. This uh, this uh, You get it at Target, and it's uh, Crazy Aaron's thinking putty. <laughs> and she just made a ladle and then poured water into it and drank out of it. Because I'm a curious person, and I wanted to know if it would hold or would go through. It kind of did. It literally held. And I How just... about you be curious about what I'm saying there? I but... am. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, all right. So your point was that it's all based on bullshit because because that it, you can build a business, that, but it won't employ a lot of people because the Trump organization, from an employment perspective, is very small. So when when we talk to friends that work in uh, corporate corporate work, think of how how many people don't actually very do very much there, and they pretend to be busy. They make up reasons that they're necessary. That's why we've had no productivity gains in 40 years. Exactly right, because people are just all bullshitting about their actual productivity to their bosses to keep their phony baloney jobs. And what happens when everybody figures out that all of this economy is just a sham? Well, I think we're already there because, too, uh, I posted an article in the newsroom. There's actually a brand new study on entrepreneurship in the United States. 
Are you fidgeting over there? Yeah. yeah. She just tried to put the fidget putty over the microphone. It would have. She just made a fidget putty condom. It's a necklace. Put it over your yeah. head and see if air can get in. Hey, curiosity <laughs> is going to kill the kill cat. Kill the cat. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> but the three best friends were the three best friends. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> the gang. Are you really an e- ENFP? Yeah. <sighs> Can't you tell? Are you? I'm one. I'm an Brother. ENFP. Oh, I'm an God. ENFJ. Uh, you can't yeah. tell that I'm an ENFP? Oh, I, 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 I didn't know. <laughs> the really in, annoying one. The Gen Z version in the female form. It's That's what was tough friends. to decide. The three best friends. <laughs> <laughs> you really need to watch the, the, the actual full show on YouTube because just it, it, watch it because it's so funny to watch Kat as she's doing things during the show. Like last week she was raking. Then at one point, like Jeff and I, you were making a great point. Jeff and I started sword fighting with uh, back scratchers. <laughs> right. But Kat just does nothing but fidget the whole time yeah, unless she's talking I, well that's a, no i am down here i'm like the hand she's signing. listening she's paying attention oh i know i can't she's pay just attention. an active listener yeah right it's my gen Zness. yeah but so <laughs> Pl- please stop showing us your gen Zness. so <laughs> like you what did, when you grew up did you want to be an entertainer immediately day one no i i grew up i wanted to be a teacher did you really because your yeah. mom was uh another government leech yeah <laughs> <laughs> private school well well, Greek school. Greek school, right. right. No, uh, I wanted to be a teacher because it was the only thing I I knew. Mm-hmm. I knew my I knew my dad. Okay, yeah, that's normal. Worked yeah. in small business, and my mom was a teacher, well, professor, I guess. And I just loved being in school so much. Like, did what you else? really? Yeah, like growing up, I did. You, I did, you like time. school? Fucking yeah, nerd. <laughs> Until I didn't like learning, but I. Well, liked you also had like a broadcast program at your high school, which is bullshit. Yeah, that like was. You great. had news, like daily news. Well, yeah, I did the news every day. Well, okay, like I'm a Channel One in house. Oh, I know. Channel. Ridiculous. Good morning so and did, welcome to News. So did we. Uh, I saw. I helped start it at Plainfield. Yeah, but then you guys fucking ruined it because you hacked it and started saying obscene things over it, and no one else got to use it again. Then you killed a turtle, and we didn't go to go to the zoo. <laughs> and then you all jumped in the pool for your senior prank, and so the pool shut down. My senior year all of that Aww. all of that is true yeah no but i i genuinely enjoyed elementary school because i loved it's you had centers like you did art for five minutes and then did music for five minutes like workstations yeah and it was just productive and active and i loved it and then middle school that's um, interesting huh that's so much different than what we had see well and that's the thing is i remember middle and high school was very sit down in the desk you know structured, writing wrote, structured um memorization and it, but in elementary school, when we did the structured stuff, it was it was good. But it was, and I didn't go to like a hippie school. I went to just a public school. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, I think it just was a great school. But just the centers, the the different styles of learning. But then again, that's when, because I was in kindergarten, I think t- two thousand one, mm-hmm. right? Oh my god! I know, I know, and. I think Wait, hold on. I blacked out there for a minute. I know. <laughs> you say you were in kindergarten in two thousand and one? Yeah, like nine eleven happened then. You mean? I know. The year I was a senior? Junior. All right. Well, anyways. No, that's, um, that's, sorry. That is just such like a, that just hit to that's the That's a kick God. in the dick, isn't it? I, I feel like I'm ready to enroll on Medicare. <laughs> <laughs> well, Grandpa, I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that was a fake laugh. Uh, yeah, but, he's making fun of you. <laughs> I know. I mean. But, you should uh, do some research on self-abortion. Oh, well, honestly. <laughs> Late term. Silly <laughs> buddy. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Really seal it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it was because in the right in the 2000s, that's when I noticed you you didn't learn the traditional ways to add and divide. Yeah. It was all the new. Let's think outside the box. Let's do creative things. Let's right. sit in beanbag chairs. Because you have to have like a basic rote memorization and like skills to operate from, like a basic platform everyone needs. Right, but then you kind of like are set free. Right, but here's my. What I kind of notice is I think the reason my age group is so, I want to be an entertainer. I want to do something creative all day. And I'm to blame, too. I want to do all these things. Is because we grew up, we did the structure, like structured stuff in school was boring. That was boring sit-down work that nobody wanted to do. Tedious and just Tedious and awful. But then when it came to the creative stuff, you know, we were still learning about uh, geography or other languages or art by being active. But... It was it was more fun, and so that's so is that sort of when it switched over for you from wanting to be a teacher to wanting to be a podcaster <laughs> and intern at a comedy radio <laughs> no, show. No, it was high school when all of you the got on the news. No, honestly, it was high school when I went from sitting in these desks and getting yelled at for slouching, and you know having to pay attention and take notes and do all this stuff. And Learn- then you and your learning, learning, but learning, learning in an 
awful way to yeah, me right. personally. Learning in the traditional way, which well, I'm I'm not good at. Well, so like our traditional our education system, like the one I grew up in, is yeah. actually uh, it was modeled after the Soviet Union's. Really. And so it's and it was designed for basically assembly line production of mm-hmm. um, compliant citizens. Mm-hmm. And so that's like you experienced like the last remnants of that Soviet model of education. And it changed halfway. assembly line, yeah. And so then you got to the part where it was like more Montessori, where it was a little bit. Yeah, I went to Montessori preschool. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes perfect sense why you are the way you are. Yeah. 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 You just kind of like drift like a gypsy, like in in and Basically, out of things that you're. I've got my van in. outside, but <laughs> I I think it's interesting that you know for the education system is that. I think now, even though those Montessori schools are still around, are are here and we're trying to be more creative and stuff, how I was looked down upon by my peers and my teachers because I couldn't learn Mm -hmm. in the (laughs) traditional... You're ADHD. I'm stupid. Because I couldn't learn in the traditional setting. Well, you couldn't retain information because you weren't focused on it. Exactly. You know, I had to... Fidgeting, nowadays it's cool. Back then, they would yell at me. Now they have spinners. They'd send me out in the hall. Now they got spinners. No, <laughs> but when it came to my like broadcasting news classes, I was I had straight A's. I was in like seven, so yeah, advanced. Because you're interested in it. Because I was interested, right. and because I was I was doing things. You know, mm-hmm. my art classes I was decent in. My gym, uh, my English classes where we got to go outside and reenact stuff was great. I was exactly the same way. Were you that way, Greg, or were you like a well-rounded student? I so I had an interesting experience. Like so my dad was a professor and like very much an academic elitist. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay, great, amazing, wonderful people, but very much an academic elitist. And my sister was like the rock star growing up. Of course. Um, and so I, but then like she just didn't like she, you know everyone goes through that rebellious phase, and then I saw how <laughs> she like, I was South always Park. a B plus student. Like and then was super involved in sports, like every sport, every season, all the time, right. and, or like activities. Like my mom was the head of youth group, so I was always at that. Because like, I grew up in the church, right? As you were coming in, I was like, I've served my time. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, gotta leave. Yeah, Spangles and here. I've done 17 years. There's a new youth minister. It's <laughs> I've, it's time for me to segue out. Like, Which is hilarious because he would have been my guy. Jim would have been your guy, and he still was. Like we liked each other. He's like, you don't want to come, and I'm like. Jim, I swear to God, if you had to go through Veggie Tales like I did, <laughs> and go through, you know, DC Rocks, our God is an awesome God, and all our the- God is an awesome God. So it was still, like my generation speaking in tongues. I from, still like, talk to, concerts. I still talk to Jim this day. Jim was like a former drug addict. Oh yeah, went to a, Washington High School. Was like a star defensive end. Cr- Christian uh, screamo band. Like yeah. he was a he had an earring. Some Performing of the actor had, now in Chicago, right? Yeah, he wow. is. Uh, he uh, he's a great. He guy. smoked and drank and oh. hit it all. Oh, we, we we like we we found out last night that we both went to the same church camp, Epworth Forest. Yeah, and I, said it. I was confirmed there. I didn't go for the camp. Up but. in uh, up in uh, North Webster Lake in Indiana, up in Kosciuszko County, and uh, North Webster. Yeah, there I know North Webster. There's an uh, something Webster, Indiana. Um, the stimulator, the strip clubs there. <laughs> <laughs> it's right on Lake Chapman by Lake Chapman, Lake Orange. Well, this went to a strip right, club uh, there, a bachelor party there last. Uh, we almost sunk a boat two summers ago. <laughs> It was a great time. So this is Everett Forest, and uh, they have a big plaster Jesus, and then they have a fountain right across from it. And uh, that's where you were. That's, she was confirmed, and you went each summer. I went uh, each summer. Uh, well, at, but you went like sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Yes. Okay. And uh, and so pickle Zach Pingleton, hell of a great guy. A great guy. He went and uh, pooped in a fountain. And uh, later that night, they like the big prank there was to put dish soap in it so it would get all bubbly. And all the Christian kids were like, hee, hee, hee. And like, little did they know, Pickle had pissed and shit in the fountain <laughs> yep. hours before. And like him and Jim were just watching it laugh, laughing, laughing to death. And like, and, and keep in mind, like, so that's when you were coming in. When right. I was leaving that oh, same year, you had Johnny Strange. And we, it was like an act of heresy. If, oh, if you liked laser tag because it was violent or like, you know, it was right. very much everybody hold hands. Give me your, give me your testimony, man. I want to hear your testimony. Yeah. Tell me how pure your faith is, man. Right. Uh, like, yeah. let's go to Asbury and I'll be youth ministers and right. be like quasi John Mayers. Right. No, you, you had, Johnny's a great guy, but yeah. Wonderful. Love him. It, but. I, it, that youth program held no, I was an atheist at the time. So it held no like. And I've been an iconoclast my whole life. So yeah. like sitting through that was like per- watching performance art and i'm like none of this is impacting me i'm, I'm a, i don't I'm, think god is petty so i don't think this is at all what i what i need to be doing we're at church we're at epworth one summer and i get a phone call from my then high school girlfriend she had jacked me off and then had fingered herself and thought she had gotten herself pregnant 
And so I'm at church camp every night praying. Why are you slouching? Pray, she, <laughs> praying to the Lord that I'm not going to have a child at 17. And like you so, thought you could. We didn't know. <laughs> didn't you take health with Mr. Teeny? Yeah, but I didn't pay attention. Thank you for listening to We Are Libertarian. Was, penis, was, penis, 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 vagina, vagina, vagina. Giggling vagina. the whole time. And so I, I was just like, hee, hee, hee. And uh, so. Let's pray. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm like talking to Jim about it. We're laying in, in and like he's in a bed and like I went in there. You're laying I, in bed with your youth. He was, he was like taking a nap and then. Because Most of the time. We had bunk beds. And so I'm like sitting on the edge of the bed having this serious conversation with him about this. And then out of the the top bunk flies Pickle. Pingleton just starts humping the shit out of me. <laughs> and At G- church camp with G- the youth minister. In, right next to in, us in bed laughing his ass While off. While you think you're a father. <laughs> <laughs> From jacking each other off. It was known as the immaculate hand job. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. But. Uh, I forget what we were even talking about. All right, talking. Oh, I was talking about, we are libertarian. No, it's not time to end because Damn it. you were confirmed you were saved, okay? Not everybody's as lucky as you can. Yeah. They don't get to spend hey, the Methodist, eternity. The three best friends were the three best friends. We're all Methodist now. We're big on this group thing. I'm a libertarian. I'm individual. I'm, uh, I'm unique. Right. Don't get your... So <laughs> <unique>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... <laughs> The cultural trends are interesting, though, because a lot of them were planned. Like, if you read what the Frankfurt School at in Germany's plans were, like, so these trends, the gender, mm. the family, breakdown of the family, right? the, um, really, the elimination of any, cl- like, distinct clarifications. Why don't you chug that? Chug, 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 chug. <laughs> Come on. I'm totally kidding. It's are a pop, by the way. <laughs> uh, it's a pop. It's a pap. It's a pap with it's my pillow in the Midwest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was like a weird Midwest rap I just made. Uh, what are you for Northern Indiana? Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Literally, weird. yes. Yeah. You want some weirdo. blueberries? Ow. Do you like some Amish crack? Yeah, some lemon cake. If you don't bring us Amish crack to the party uh, or to the podcast next week, you're in trouble. I'll bring it to the podcast. All right. But yeah, so like all, all, all these things it. that you're seeing happen, you think are rising organically, right? Right. Like, you think it's just societal progress that your Gen Z is deciding at this point that they've just had enough of the old ways, and so this is sort of the natural <clears throat> culmination of backwards thinking, right? T- traditional Christian Christian conservative thinking right. that's you know had a, a iron grip on society, and it's right. not. It isn't. It was planned. So it's copycat. So no. So the Frankfurt School. So um, so Karl Marx. You know who that is? <laughs> yeah. Who is he? <laughs> Uh, Tell me more about the religious freedom the uh, George Washington wanted in your your creative history. (laughs) Why are you being so mean to me? No, I'm kidding. Well, I I just... the family. (laughs) The three best friends. (laughs) I'm sorry. I shouldn't shouldn't pick on you. (laughs) It's not your fault that your teachers neglected. fucking stupid. You should go back to elementary school and demand... They be like, right. give me my finger paint back. <laughs> I want the Alex Jones version. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not watching the full show on YouTube, when uh, she sings the Three Best Friends song, she reaches and grabs both of us on the shoulder and rocks us. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I going to say? No, only thing I know about Mar- uh, Marx is literally from everything that every crazy socialist kid I follow is that he is God. Mm-hmm. He Everything that he's written about the economy, about people, should be... It works, but for some reason, because it works so well and it is the best, we're not doing it. Yeah, and and so like so with Marx, he um, historical determinism, the thought that history is something, the arc of history has a known destination. Communism is inevitable. Capitalism will fall away. Mm-hmm. So that's um, everything. Is, like and so Marx wrote about commun the communist. He didn't really clearly define what it would look like when it ar- arose. And if you <laughs> don't quit laughing, I swear to God, I don't know why. I keep laughing. <laughs> You just started giggling. You looked over at me, and you were you were thinking something dirty, honestly. No, I was not. And then you looked at me, and I caught your eye, and then you started giggling. I'm sorry, I'm seriously listening. Like I feel like one of your Bob and Tom coworkers. This <laughs> this passive aggression. He named the day job. He named the day job. Oh yeah, edit that out. That's fine. Um, no, it's on the space books. So. No, but go on. I I really am listening. But so um, the idea was that we were marching towards a known destination. That mm-hmm. it was all inevitable. Marx clearly he was the first to sort of discover it and say this is how it works it's sort of um the existing status quo synthesis and then we challenge it and then it slowly moderates and eventually we arrive there right now what happened is so like vladimir lenin and um joseph stalin Mm -hmm. so they ended up great guys actually vladimir lenin wasn't that bad a guy it was that 
he believed in Marx's historical determinism so much that it, it, it's like um, it's like the 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 upper middle class engineers in Germany who just could so they could choose to selectively dismiss the Holocaust because well it's for the greater good they thought they were marching toward progress right, right. which is the same thing that happened in the so with Lenin. And so the idea was that eventually you could get all of humanity, all the years of like me being an American, you being Greek, you being uh, white, <laughs> pink. Uh, I was going to say Canadian, but I'm he German. gets offended. I'm That's German. true. You being Bavarian, yep. right? You being Bavarian. So all of this would wa- didn't matter. All that mattered was the workers versus the rich people. Right. And so his the Soviet Union was an experiment in all of the working class people defining themselves as workers rather than like nations with mm-hmm. a national identity and they'd revolt against the rich and then we'd have communism mm-hmm. that failed miserably because what they found is that like uh, do you know who che Guevara is have you seen a che t-shirt you know fidel castro yeah I heard him so is che he- Guevara was like the uh, intellectual um he was a doctor he mm-hmm. the, uh, rode a motorcycle all throughout south america going and helping people that he blamed the rich um, for creating all this poverty and he would treat them free of cost like a gypsy. That's why I wondered if you knew him. Um, (laughs) But so he thought, so he in the Soviet Union, it was this experiment to unite workers. It failed because they could never get people to stop viewing themselves as their country, their tribe, their family first. It never, that never washed away. So then you got the Frankfurt School Mm -hmm. after that failed they came up with the idea, well, we'll just undermine all of the institutions in society by an endlessly harping on it over and over and over and progress towards no genders, towards, um, you know, basically toward communal rearing of children like Geraldine Greer back in the first wave of feminism. Right. Um, advocating these radical ideas, knowing full well it wouldn't be adopted, but it would push and push and push and push until it had they'd gotten very close to what they were trying to achieve. Right. And so that is where this idea um, came from. Is So because Lenin and the Soviet Union failed as a way to arrive at communism, what we got was the Frankfurt School, who then the University of Columbia put in there, where, um, in Harlem, where they put their uh, philosophy department, political science, sociology, all a bunch of former Frankfurt School professors mm-hmm. after World War II. And that is why they have... Uh, like the Northeast and Timothy Leary and these individuals, they have just continually pushed for these societal ideas and all ideas start in academia and then filter down. Yeah. And what we're, you're seeing is what you thought is just all of these things happening organically mm-hmm. by people critically thinking, well, why, would, why do we have genders? Right. Is actually top down autocratic decision that was made 60 years ago, 70 Absolutely. years ago, in order to get to communism, Marxism. That's why it's called cultural Marxism rather than economic Marxism. They're going to do it by culture, really. Mm-hmm. Because I think I mean, really, in re- reality, you have uh, a lack of social shame around certain speech, and so instead of passing a law to limit speech, you get so shame is used to keep to tail your speech. You know where the word, term racist comes from? Where Vladimir Lenin. Really, Lenin coined it in his essay on socialism as a way to make bourgeoisie beliefs disgusting gross cultural pros- so he coined the term racist huh. i put it in our in our group chat his essay and it would be a way of social shame that they would use to antagonize and influence any belief they didn't like they would label you a racist right and this goes all the way this is over 100 years old right mm-hmm. so, so that's that's the term racist was designed it didn't arise organically it was selected to shame people sure so um, i uh, i tweeted out last night if any of my future wives want a wedding hashtag, I am calling it off. <laughs> that was brilliant. Thank you. Well, that was great. Holly took exception to it. And Who? Some person that I knew long ago in politics that I thought we were, I was cool with, but apparently she doesn't like me. After reading your Twitter today, I doubt it's something you really have to worry about. <laughs> and then so I just replied. Sick burn. I said, <laughs> sorry for being a truth teller. Uh-oh. To a which, soothsayer. To which she replied, it's that you misinterpret your sexist ignorance for charm. If it weren't so sad, it would be cute. With, uh, like, a gif of someone going, aw. So I just replied with, uh, with, uh, Trump. Trump making Can't go fr- wrong. So, Did you? Oh, yeah. I just, oh, that I, one, though, was so benign. And then, uh, you you should have called her fake news. You should have used that new SpongeBob meme that was like, <laughs> 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 Do you use SpongeBob memes? 
You know, the I've, never watched it. I've never watched oh, it. I've never watched it. We got something to do tonight. Jason, <laughs> Jason uh, replied, "Mangled by Spangle." <laughs> Hashtag uh, Mangled by Spangle. Do little did. Uh, so, no, no, somebody different. But like, that's an instance where I was, cl- I was. Do I think that I'm going to have multiple wives? And if my wife... Well, you're on pace, so that's an accurate... (laughs) And if my wife wanted to have a hashtag, what do I really care? Like That's the thing. Like Every wedding I've been to over the last three summers, like last hurrah for the Shah or, you know, don't be long, long, or like stuff like that. Every single bride has had a hashtag. I just think it's kind of... And then got married at Maverick's. Right. Oh, the honeymoon. Just like the Val new Vista. gender reveal with the babies. Oh, yeah. Mm-mm. Cake cutting. Mm-mm. Yeah, I just think it's <laughs> I think it's hokey and silly, and I don't like puns, and it just is, it's so overdone, and it was it was interesting and cute like two years ago. Now everybody's doing it, and they're not very clever. No. And so it just annoys me, and so, like, I don't really care that much, but, like, I'm a sexist now. And so, like, that's a very clear indication of, like, uh, no, 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 no. You must your speech conform to these, you, you know. I mean, Public opinion is how they shame. Exactly, and it's they don't try anything legally anymore. Right, it's like Paula Deen. Right, they destroyed her career in the press rather than actually ever taking the time to ask what was said or doing a real investigation, and so they they crush someone's industry. Martha Stewart, same thing. Like they just everything is tried in public opinion with right. the left because then they don't have to worry about facts and you know uh providing evi- like you know an evidentiary hearing any of the real formalities of actual justice if uh yeah there's a book called so you've been publicly shamed and it follows the uh the woman who flew from uh america to south africa or from england to south africa and made the joke about you know how she isn't going to get aids because she's white and she's like a a socialistic type sympathizer and was making a joke, you know, mocking people who believe that way. But the internet took it because of Gawker. Yep. Took it and uh, and, and then and, turned and her and into turned hate her, speech and turned her into hate speech. Yeah. And uh, by the way, I which wa- that's our fate. By the way, I hope you're okay with that. Uh, yeah. Like I'm, t- I you know I like invite my hate career, speech. My career hasn't started and it's already over. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're ahead of the trend, and by the time we really arrive, we're going to be, you know, it'll be all coming together at the right time. Oh, we'll be. You know, we're going to be in the Steven Crowder world, in the Milo world. It's it's going to you be. You think? You really think? No, we're thoughtful. Yeah, yes. They do, they're just, they just you know, tar and feather. See, and oh. that's the thing. I disagree because the people that I'm with, like my, these young generation uh, kids, when by the time everyone else dies out and we're at the top, we're not going to stand for that. There's any, act, so like Newton's law, um, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Mm-hmm. And since societies are organic living things, Anytime there is a consistent push, like Trump is in very many ways the right fist in the face of every Portland hipster that has been crying about gender yes. for the last 30 years and telling white people they're to blame. You know, my whole premise of why I thought Trump was going to rewrite the industrial Midwest on the electoral map was because eventually white people, white men specifically, get tired of being told they're the reason to blame. That right. you're racist. And that- so it's like, well, now we got this guy. I, I How about that? How about that? I don't know Holly, and I don't. Uh, I, I mean, I've met her a few times, and we've interacted on Twitter, and uh, somebody that I respect. But in you know, she doesn't really know me. But I'm sexist because of a joke. Like, and if anybody really knew me, they know how. I, listen, I love women. Nobody loves women more than me, right, Cat? <laughs> You would be the best woman's president in the history right. of yeah. the United States. No, I think I, I, I'm... No, I, you are way more um, accommodating and thoughtful about sexist type of language than I am. Uh, uh, like, way, I mean, you are way more sensitive to, like, than you know, most people. sexism than... Right. Hard, hell, hardly any libertarian. Right. And so I, I don't... I, I Like, that's why I'm like, oh, she doesn't know me. I don't care. You know, but it, this is the world that we're living in. A single tweet is going to ruin someone. It's, it can ruin your career, you know. So it's. And is it, this the start, or is this how is this how it's going to be forever? I think it's how it is forever. I think I just think that's buckle up. That's how it is. Yeah. I think it isn't. And that's the cost of freedom. Like that's we have freedom of, of information, total freedom of speech on the on the internet, and the and the thing about systems that allow freedom of speech. Like when when books were started to to be printed, when newspapers were started to be printed, when you had telephones and then radio and then television and cable, 
And every time that the ability to expand human communication democratize ex- knowledge it exists it it exposes the best and the worst of humanity mm-hmm. and so everybody blames the technology like is are our cell phones or is twitter making us this way or that way it's like no that's how humans are already mm-hmm. we're just seeing it in a more clear cut defined way and that's a good thing we should have the full appreciation of how human beings work and how society works and the the consequences to you know, but you you better have a thick skin. I mean, it's you, you have know. to have the real problem is that very few people have a sound foundation of like knowledge or truth or really a, like a moral philosophy. Um, well, truth doesn't. I mean, in the postmodern world, truth doesn't. Well, post-truth really society, like yeah. President Obama said, you know, yeah. where everything is both true and false at the same time. Sure, and that's the best. I mean, he is a brilliant social commentator, the president, very thoughtful. And that is just so the post-truth society, that could not be a more accurate description. We live in a world where everything is at simultaneously both fact and not true at all. Yeah. The same fact. What What is true to your mom, Kat, is not true to your college friends. Mm-hmm. And it, right. But it's truth to both sides and false on the other side and and even accepting the truth and the actual like empirical stated facts what's happened in our society if it uh, uh, if a democrat accepts the facts submitted by someone that they oppose that is an act of um treason Mm -hmm. you can't even have a middle ground discussion because even conceding that these are the facts we're going to debate is an act of hostility against your own. Absolutely, global warming is a great example of it. Perfect. You can't. It, it's the new. It's the new world religion. Oh yeah, it's eco religion. Yeah, mm-hmm. you and, know. And and by even stating, I don't know, not all this. I mean, I watched, if we I if was, Al Gore were right, we'd be underwater right now. If yeah. if I watched Rick Perry give, I listened. <sighs> I listened to the audio of Rick Perry give his. Uh, his uh, press conference killed it. By the way, he, looked he, like a president. Right, he did great, and uh, he basically was asked, "Do you believe that in global in man-made cli- climate change?" Man-made climate change, and he said, uh, "Yes, I believe that climate change is real, and yes, that I mean uh, that I think man has some con- does contribute to it in some way." That'd be like saying a, a huge variable had no impact, right? Which is ridiculous. Which for a conservative. That is a big statement out of Rick Perry's mouth. And he'll get crap for it, and they'll probably try to hold him accountable by some pack. You know what? You know what uh, the headlines were? In another portion of the press conference, he uh, he said that not all the science is settled. And so that's... It never is. That's what they, that's what they used, and so they made him look like he's a climate change denier. Yeah. Like, and they made him look ridiculous, and this is why... This is why Trump's elected. Yeah, like because everyone's stupid, and that's the thing though is you, you and I, like let's even say, or like let's like Cat wanted to have a their political union at Ball State have a debate, and Cat wanted to represent the libertarian perspective, and talk about marriage, right, gay marriage with a Democrat or a liberal. She's on that side. She doesn't, as a libertarian, she has do whatever makes you happy. It doesn't affect me, mm-hmm. right. But she were to then continue on and say that's, but, but as far as actually administering marriage. I don't believe that we should use tax dollars that are forcibly taken from other people in order to create a bureau that, you know, uh, uh, issues licenses to, you know, to citizens because I think that is force. And so I don't support the state being involved in marriage. Right. She would be tarred and feathered as anti-gay marriage uh-huh. by the, the Snowflake, you know, caucus. Right. Well, it's just like... Uh Phil Robertson, the, from one of the Duck Dynasty guys, who gave that big, you know, the interviewer was asking him his thoughts on gay marriage, and he said, you know, oh, I don't. Basically, what happened was everyone was publicly shaming him. Oh my God, they're so homophobic. They don't believe in gay marriage. But what they didn't, you know, they just pulled that soundbite. What they didn't hear was the rest of the interview. Interview where he said, "But I'm a Christian, and you have to love everybody, treat everyone with respect." Yeah, he fully like you know expounds upon why that statement he believes that statement like he gives it the necessary nuance so it doesn't sound like just a moron exactly and of course nobody cared no no we don't have time like it's a sound bite society and you hear what you bumper hear. stickers aren't long enough anymore or too long anymore yeah i mean it's a 140 character world for news and, and digesting information 
so my next question is is that i had so i've been listening to a podcast and one of the podcasts that i listened to they had a transgendered youtuber as a guest and this youtuber i forget the name but she is hated because lauren southern no it's blair white I think Blair White. <laughs> Blair White. Yeah, transgender and has a YouTube channel where all they talk about how, you know, why black li- black lives matter is a scam. Why <laughs> why transgendered people need thicker skin? Why this? Why this? And if you listen to her, of course that's like you're crazy, you're 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 sick, you're how could you believe that you're trans? Where's your empathy? Where's your humanity? Cuz they're they're trans of so they have to be for it just like, you know, and it, you the listen default to it and is that anything stuff. other than they if you oppose the default of the vi- the victim then yeah. you're you're Hitler. Well, right. And, you know, a lot of... They were saying on the podcast, the people were like, yeah, you know, we're liberal and you make a lot of good points. And one of the points she made was... Because they, they said, you know, trans people have been around. You look in the history books. I'm, you know... They've been around. Uh, it's it's a new thing. It's science. You know, it's not a, it's not a new thing. No, and, uh, there's a... The Danish girl, uh, there was a movie about it. Like, in Europe, God, 150 years ago. And, like... Uh, yeah, I yeah, forget yeah. what the movie oh. was. Uh, yeah, yeah, I forget the actor. It's just... <laughs> Yeah, just out. Yeah. So, and they said, why is it now that everyone is saying that, oh, I'm not necessarily transgender, but, oh, I'm a I'm a gender fluid, queer. Non-binary. Non-binary, blah, 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 blah. It's and all just fluid. These 14-year-olds. And this, this controversial YouTuber said, it's because this is 2017 in 20, when did, when did all this start, would you say? Trans. Like the ability to perform the surgery? No, 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 no. Like the saying, I'm non-binary, I'm gender. Oh, within the last 10 years. Within the last 10 years, they Easily. said. It first showed up like at Berkeley and like more of the, like the Ken- uh, Kenyon College in Ohio, like the really hardcore radical it's schools. It's become a meme in the last year or two. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they Mainstream. Said, yeah. yeah. Okay. So they said, she said that 2015 was the year that emo kids died. That the emo gothic phase is gone. So that she said, you know, twenty seven. <laughs> it, it was. A, it's a good quote. She said, twenty seventeen. The the emos are out. The tranny. The tr- she said the trannies are here. Mm-hmm. And she said it's it's another. She said, and she's trans herself. And she was like, yes, I'm, I'm trans. I have the psychological whatever. Blah 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 blah. But these you know twelve, thirteen, fourteen year old kids who I meet at my meet and greets who say, oh, I'm non binary. This I'm a I'm they them zs or whatever. And she's just like, no, you don't. You don't get it. Mm-hmm. And she said it's because you see the, the ki- these kids who grew up my middle school years, everyone was emo and mm-hmm. listening to the music and the hair and the makeup, whatever. Um, Ours was school shooters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yours was school shooters. Trench coats. Mm-hmm. Right. That cupcake fade. Yeah. And, you know, they, the emo kids grew out of High it. High score. <laughs> right. Stop. And, and they grew out of it. And now, you know, it's this is the new thing. Yeah, so and this I just is, the, this is so the replacement for being um, unique and... Uh, sort of brooding and very you know there's there's so much more to me i'm an onion you need to know right. all the layers Shut exactly up. You're, you're 16 you don't know shit yeah exactly I just thought that was so interesting so she said when a lot of it coincides with the north carolina trans the, the supreme court case eventually about um you know north carolina what was it not deciding or they said whatever your gender is on your license is the restroom you need to use mm-hmm. and so there's been a lot of, that's been a you know tried in the courts over and over and over and so I, but it uh, trans and like gender has even the bi- <laughs> like the biological basis has been you know left behind long ago, mm-hmm. and then so then it's about well whatever you, makes you feel comfortable and gives you mental peace, which exactly. I'm all for. Like sure, you know yeah, I yeah. don't care if it's Islam, if it's Christianity, if it's Jack Daniels, if it's <laughs> your gender, if it gets you you know gives you peace and you you're know, not hurt, happiness. If you're, if you're not whatever hurting, you need to do, yeah. If you're not hurting other people, go for it. And right. so like now though, it, it's gone even further where it's beyond gender, and it is even into the area like it's in the realm of fantasy and fiction and um, like so there was a guide put out um, that se- that talked about when certain genders are appropriate or situationally appropriate. Right. And what those gender, I forget who put out the guide, Heat, uh, the street or the heat or whatever really made fun of it and just wrote it outright condemnation and so did National Review. It would be the heat then. Yeah, yeah but so they were site. mocking, it was on like, I think the College Fix and she wrote a guide about when certain genders you were culturally appropriating them and it was no longer okay <laughs> because you could use a, cheer, or a Navajo, in certain elements, a masculine Navajo gender identity would be cultural appropriation and you need to think about that what you're doing by perpetuating that myth and i thought how did nationality get infused with gender 
And that's the thing is it's become like a situationally specific uh, role. Like that, yeah. it, it's no. really no different. But they don't like, want no, it to what, be. But right. What it has become is whatever that person finds offensive. And so that that is the difference between the rule of law and the rule of man. The rule of law says everybody's free except you can't do these things to each other. Right. And we're going to write them down and they're not negotiable. Don't hit your sister. Don't steal your neighbor's stuff. Don't do these things. The rule of man is whatever the man decides, that is the rule. And Anything outside the norm that they can convince 51% they don't like. And so if you, yeah. if you read Animal Farm by Orwell, it, it is basically the, the old order is cast off, the, uh, a more fair order is instituted, and everybody is equal, and then eventually all animals are equal except for... Mm -hmm. Some are less than equal than others. I mean, carve out. That's the path to hell. And, and so, essentially, what we are asking for in these generations and in in this strain of thinking is the, the what whatever you are offended by is how we're going to legislate culturally. That isn't a workable framework for society. No, because eventually, every accommodation and carve out, you you create this dragnet where it's impossible not to offend anyone ever because of the number of carve outs. Like it's, a, right. it's walking on landmines. Right. Right. You know, you can't. And so the best bet is just, just always offend. Other, <laughs> just always, always be the offensive. best defense is a good offense. Other people's opinions is a prison. I've lived in that. Oh, prison. it's, ter it's nothing will rob you of your soul faster than society. Right. Other people. And, uh, cat and I have a lot of, you know, life discussions. And so we were talking recently about normal. Mm hmm. And normal is something that other people try to, you know, Kat doesn't always dress the way that the other girls in her sorority dress. And they're like, well, you know, and they kind of, they they poke fun and they mock shame. that a little bit. They shame you, essentially. Mm -hmm. Collectivists yeah. always use shame. And, and I'm tired of it. And make you doubt yourself. Mm -hmm. And I hope I'm not oversharing here. No, go ahead. Okay. And, and, and she's like, why is that? I'm like, because you they are trying to get you to conform mm -hmm. and so they are nudging you to to act the way that they act because that is comfortable for them and if you choose to accept that as what as as normal and you betray who you are then you are asking for a life of misery well that, it's only external validation exactly the only right. way you'll ever feel good about yourself if you accept that is by making them happy Right. Earning and praise. And very much the same. You know, uh, we, we had a, you can hear it on our SoundCloud, but a program called Creating Maya about someone's transition. And a lot of that, it wasn't about the transition. It wasn't about the chopping up uh, of genitals. It was about self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so, and, and, and mental peace, like accepting, you know, finding whatever it was, whatever definition or whatever identity, you know, she needed to put, put on herself. Right. That got her to a place where she wasn't outraged and angry and you know upset it with everyone else all the time yeah it, it helped a little it never but, does <laughs> but i mean and, the, and but that's still blaming others but that is freedom if you know i i am a christian and i believe the the bible is the written word of god and so do i want to go to a church that has an ordained gay pastor absolutely not because i, I you want someone who is trying to live as close to the written biblical word as as possible and uh, everybody sins and falls short of the glory of God. Of course, I certainly do. Uh, I'm one of the worst Christians alive, but it, 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 you still want to uphold that. But no denomination should be forced to ordain gay pastors. And, and if people want to go to a church with ordained gay pastors, go for it. Mm -hmm. That's your choice. That's, that's between you. What and, have you and, accepted is true and you're comfortable with? And go find it. Exactly right. And that is freedom. And, Total freedom. And the uh, allowance of other people to live their life as they see fit, as long as it is not hurting you, is freedom. Is, Total. It's, it's, that is what libertarians are trying to strive for. And I'm comfortable with people living their life and being different than me and not trying to force them to live the way that I want them to live and using the force of government to do it. I, I agree. Like I, I, I see for, for the longest time, I really despised the cultural preservationists that used government force to try yeah. to say, "Well, you're a, you know an AO pie, so you need to wear um, you know leggings, a North Face, you know a North Ugg Face boots. jacket, Uggs, and then drink a Nike dry fit hat, and, and then put your ponytail out the back, right, and drink a Starbucks drink, Irma Gerd, Irma Gerd, yeah." Um, and so for the longest time, I really hated that that uh, element of po the political element. But now, there's the 
there's this the left is Soviet left. They demand uniqueness and accommodation, but with an AK-47 for for them. And but, if you're not unique, that is something to you know. That's actually an act of offense. If you, if you are different in the way that they. There are there. You are allowed. It's like it's like George. It's no different. It's like uh, the calling the AC, the Obamacare exchanges exchanges. Like this is free market. Like George Bush d- did this prescription drug threat. Medicare Part D. Medicare Part D, where he basically said it's the free market at work, and basically the government approved three or four different people that you could choose from, and he called it free market. Well, no dumbass, that's not the free market. Yeah, that's social- I can put my head up a bull's ass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, that's not free market that's socialism exactly that's a lack of choice and sounds so, pretty free to me it's, yeah it's crony, it's culture you know it's uh, mercantilism it's culture uh cronyism right and so basically what what the the marxist left is forcing us to do <laughs> through shame public shaming you will be gender non-binary or you, you will go to jail well you must you can be different but you you may choose in these categories how you may be different or there will be consequences absolutely the thing is though with collectivists is the camaraderie so the camaraderie among the left is way different than the camaraderie on the right. Whereas with the right, there it, there is a more individualist you know identity within like the American right. And then the left though, it is all collectivist in the camaraderie and the lifestyle and the the cool kids. Right. You see it in media all the time. Like that's why everyone hated Donald Trump in the media because even being giving him a fair shake meant no longer getting invited to the art gallery opening at the Met and then the new restaurant in Soho that opened. You were no longer acceptable company. And so that's though the strain of the Soviet new left in the United States. However, that isn't going to last because unless they just simply eradicate out like the American mythology of, you know, go West young man, manifest destiny, individualism, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, good versus evil of the individual versus the rest of the world there you're not going to be able to just imprint upon all, like all these the de- complete collapse of traditional customs and norms that have sure. tied us all the way they you know that's the thing about traditions is they tie you to your past yeah and that's how you define yourself through the framework you know people that are adopted spend most of their life trying to find their biological family simply because they want to know their origin Belong- and their creation myth belonging is the is as important as food and water is to the human soul. Absolutely. And that is why we have storytelling. It is it is our information trans, tr- uh, transportation for the human mind. It, that storytelling th- through institutions like family are how people uh The story like Kat's parents, the Greek, like her grandpa right. having to stop in Elkhart because he literally ran out of money, get a job, build a billiards company. The son takes it over and grows it. That's the American success story. And she takes from that the values that her her ancestors had, and then she puts those to work. The pride of, you know, taking initiative and building your own thing and, you know, start being the originator and taking it upon yourself rather than, you know, going to work at a factory and saying, look at the middle management going on Hawaiian vacations and we can't even get two to more dollars an hour, yada, yeah. yada, yada. Like, that, as long as that spirit isn't eradicated out, I think there'll be a constant break against progress. But like if you look at the cultural like the cultural Marxist, the school, I'll just read you what their goals were. Okay. And you can tell me, Kat, and you see if we're, how we're doing against what they wanted to do 70 years ago. Right. Okay. All right. Number one goal stated, first support the dilution and then abolishment of majority cultures via the politically correct dominance of minority and immigrant cultures, typically using slurring accusations of racism, fascism, and white supremacy to attack those who who oppose our platform of political correctness. Mm. Number one goal. Now, wh- wh- who wrote these goals? The culture, the Frankfurt School. This is the goal. In, the, this is year? cultural infiltration in what would have been 19, mid-1950s. Okay. Wow. All right. Afterwards, a smoothing over of all the remaining cultural mass into an amorphous and unoriginal blob, which loses all aspects of its former cultural identity and is thenceforth mo- uh, henceforth mo- molded into a new and unprecedented form of being. Uh. Second goal. Well, that's what you're worried about. Where does this end? An amorphous blob that's undefined, you know, except through uh, public opinion and peer like acceptance. Right. So then it goes on. Uh, sorry, I have to go to the next page. So unprepared. But uh, gender, like, so uh, the bullet points note is gender el- elimination. Right. So the breakdown of the nuclear family. Mm-hmm. Um, 
then it goes into a breakdown of basically like capitalist institutions such as marriage. Right. Eliminating that, uh, the elimination of any type of corporate limited liability reform, like corporations not having full liability for loss. Right. Eliminating that and replacing it with worker driven guilds where. You know, it's a committee that decides how best to organize and run everything. Right. Democratically elected committee. Um, and then the complete dissolution of any lasting vestige of man, male or female um, roles that are defined through the sex. Huh. So, the, like your grandmother, you know, you stay at home, raise the kids, take domestic ro- duties. Mm-hmm. Shame that out of culture entirely. And so there is no predisposition towards what role you should play, whether domestic or mm-hmm. in your professional career. Right. I mean, all of these things that we've made tremendous, the p- progress has been enormous. Sure. Mm-hmm. And it, it all, it's really the Frankfurt School is where it was the academic crowd that started this. But then you always need a political class to actually implement these things. Right. And those have their roots in the Fabian Society. Right. And Fabian Socialism, what that was, was the idea that rather than revolutionary communism, which revolutions typically fail like that's why people say american exceptionalism is we were the exception to the rule of revolution leading to chaos like in france we are literally the only peaceful transfer of political power from one in existence in, in existence where we went from one form of government to another it i mean With, and and it, and you can say that it's uh with people trying to, you know, split us up, sure. you know, foreign entities trying to get like st- individual states to pick right. sides, like we, you know, we made it, which is yeah. it literally, it's not that we're the greatest country on earth, like through the way people mean it when they say it. Right. American exceptionalism, we are, we're the unicorn, we're the, the neo or the anomaly. Right. Mm-hmm. And so by undermining these things, these sort of like the idea of Western great thinking, all the way going back to like the Greeks, you know, those people. You're you know who Plato is? Yeah. Do She's you? playing with Plato right now. Of course, my mortified. people. <laughs> Absolutely mortified. <laughs> the three best friends were the three best friends. Are you, the three best friends. Have you seen the movie 300? No. Really? Oh, I've the heard The Peloponnesian of it. War? I want to no, I've I, one of my goals is to get more into Greek. I just know like the modern Greek stuff. She's going to get more into Greek style. Like the debt crisis. Uh, yeah, I'm really into just borrowing a lot and never returning well that's what sucks like going there though for you would suck because it is what you're seeing is like this the violent militant left like lighting buildings on fire right the social war like the class warfare is turning into physical warfare there mm-hmm. you know you're getting these antifa people who show up and light buildings on fire and you know yada 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 well listen communist you motherfuckers that's right and so we're the liber- reason we're libertarians is here to stop you well the reason her great grandpa with her, her your bullshit anymore <laughs> yeah so like the reason your great grandpa came here was because of communists right. and like the rise of uh fascism like benito mussolini's mm-hmm. fascism they were fleeing in the united states cia in uh the 19 like late 80s 70s 60s we used greek double agents mm-hmm. to uh to arrest and imprison illegally detain um to uh, Papandreou, or George Papandreou, who was a communist and one of the one of the like Nazi sympathetic strongman elements, mm-hmm. yeah. we d- have to hunt up back to hunt with the CIA to take him, put him in prison, and then that's why they never fell to the like like Italy did. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And so we've even like the reason you're you're here is yeah. because of Karl Marx. Wow. They fled. The original foundation was because of their communist ideas. And that mater- turned into strongmen, and so that you would not even be here had he not, you mm-hmm. know, written Das Kapital. Yep. Because and it, you know he fled. Uh, yeah. But Pop- and now Papandreou's heirs are in elected Greek officials, communists. Yeah. Because now it's cool. And before, right? To you know, we helped to to basically do a nice little Pakistani com- tribunal and, and commandeer him and so, take him out. So okay, so we had the Red Scare in the in the thirties, twenties, right? Oh the no, fifties. McCarthyism. What? Don't, wait, wasn't there two Red Scares? The uh, like, so the Soviet Union, a lot of Americans like in the Greenwich Village had all gone to the Soviet Union. Mother Jones, who the website's named after, Jack Reed, who's buried there. Um, it was the great communist experiment of Karl, Karl Marx, led by Vladimir Lenin, mm-hmm. his protege Leon Trotsky, and then Stalin was the operations man, who eventually became the you know the right. dictator. And so, but at the, in the 1920s, that was entirely the Bolshevik Revolution. It was the working class having a revolution against the merchants or the urbanites or the 
globalists. Right. Interesting. And so that's the 1920s, but Americans were fascinated with it. Tons yeah. of the elites went over there to live and ate, gor- you know, ate, but lived, subsisted at poverty levels just to say they were a part of it. Like it Jack Reed's buried there. It, it was trendy to be. It, it, was, it has always been trendy. It, it was trendy to flirt with Nazism, with, uh, Qu- uh, with Queen Elizabeth, Nazi, Mu- Mussolini. Member. Yeah, Mussolini, you know, was revered and Hitler oh, was absolutely. Time Man of the Year. Yeah. You know. Hitler was Time Magazine's Man of the Year, yeah. 1944. Wait, yeah, that's. Not 44. What, or sorry, 41? <laughs> uh, no, Two years. It had to be it in the 30s. Been. Was yeah. it in the 30s? It, it was in the 30s. There's well, no way. Well, he didn't, way. though, but he didn't take head as head of the Third Reich from... Um, no, he was head of the th- from uh, 33 on. Well, he, no, but he he didn't even win the election. He was he took it over from uh, Hindenburg or um, Wyden. Uh, they started winning in 33. Yeah, but they never got more than over, 22% of the seats. Right, but then they started taking over... He yeah, just kept winning. 38, And <laughs> in, in Germany never got sick of 39, winning. because yeah. they invaded in 41. And, That's right. And, and they, had, they invaded in 40 in, into into uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia. Oh, yeah. Ju- the yeah. Russians and the Germans took Poland like and just started you know, like it was a game of tug of war well right. and that's and the reason I bring it up is because like you said it was trendy for the the elites to go live like that and you uh, I remember seeing the interview with Lucille Ball mm-hmm. right who was like a socialist communist oh yeah like she that. was an, uh, a you know a suspected communist party was. member but it's interesting the reason that you know the Red Scare kind of happened was uh, fear for the war right absolutely because really the Soviet Union by the 50s we realized it was no longer a social experiment of, you know, Greenwich Village liberals trying to he, he perfect was, society. He was starving seven million people in the Ukraine. Yeah. Right. So my my question is, because I guess you could say the war and all, all that was going on, that's what changed drastically from it's cool to be communist and socialist to got to be the nuclear family. So my question is, is there going to be something big for us that's is going to flip the snowflakes? An inflection point? Back to... That's a good. That's a good question because the the flaw of communism has always been the same thing. You can never find the the perfect, you know, philosopher king to run it so that it works. Mm-hmm. It always turns into totalitarianism with mass, you know, killings. Yeah. No one's ever been able to take it and actually like create. And the reason why is it's opposed to human nature. Mm-hmm. The idea that humans aren't foundationally driven by self preservation and so are therefore slightly selfish. And self-interested, you can't ever eliminate that because we're animals. It's an instinct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The ideas of communism are about trying to eliminate the self. There is no individual. There's only the collective and your role in that in order to create the perfect harmonious society where there's no hunger, there's no poverty, there's no sick or you know, there's no stratification by class. It is a big amorphous blob mm-hmm. where you get cared for you know from each according to their ability to each according to their needs so you work for the community based on your skill set that's assigned to you and then you are given what you need even uh if you look up at new harmony indiana google it and yep. it was robert owen robert owens it wasn't even started by owens but it was one of the first uh communistic society and he had had one be successful in scotland prior to right and so he came here and it was a miserable failure huge but mm-hmm. still indiana has something called the common school fund which was uh, put into the indiana constitution by the owenites which says that the indiana constitution says that we will have school go- government schools correct so, here in indiana publicly so, government run schools all right let's start wrapping up so final mm. thoughts for this episode go ahead cat it was a lot. Wow. My first episode as a woke. co-host, I was woke. I'm there, woken up. This is a pretty this was a pretty healthy display of weaponized autism. Yeah, well, it's important though woo! because everyone but thinks absolutely. it's trendy or that these things just happen. Right. Exactly. And it's ideas cool. run the world. Absolutely. These ideas the no the no gender, the amorphous blob, the no sex roles, the you know, all these things and no marriage. Ideas have consequences. There was a group of men and women who are very intelligent, got in a room, decided it, and then put together a plan for implementing it, and now it's here. You're not you're not cutting edge. You're 70 years late. And, and now a bunch of drunk nerds sitting around a table in <sighs> Indiana are, have started a podcast to end their reign of miserable communistic and, terror. Damn and, right. And, you know, like I said, like you see 9-11 was the big rallying point for the country. We had... We had uh, Oh, it was the, the first time World the United War States II. had been like united like that since 9/11. dropping the bomb. So my question is, what's what's next? What's going? It, and that's where we got to my original question to start this podcast off was, which was, you know, is this 
this liberal snowflake trendy everything is it going to be this is how it's going to be forever or are we going to have something or some group of generation that stops it so very good, good what podcast. do you think me personally you know just with the peers and the way my uh people my age are and seeing how they are these radical ideas it, it scares me a bit because the only people keeping us sane and the people we look up to and get our wisdom from are, are the baby boomers the older people and when they're gone what what's going to happen however do you look, oh, do you look at baby boomers as signs of or as figures of authority not necessarily well you do Man. And the, I'm not you, judging. I'm literally no, no, asking. No, you're, you're, she, uh, to answer for you, if I may, if I may, man, sure, 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 mansplain. I, I, She'll have the uh, lobster bisque and then a side salad yes, right on the ranch. Please, I, I, you. She literally when All we right. go to, when we go out to eat, she's like, order for me. I don't care. No, I don't <laughs> order for. No, I no. I say, yeah, I'll have whatever he has. Yeah. Because I'm a girl. I don't like to speak. Anyways, go on. <laughs> All evidence to the contrary. <laughs> <laughs> the three best friends are the three best friends. <laughs> no, Kat is, you know, she's 20. Oh, yeah. I mean, she's so, so far advanced for the tw- average 20. It was stunning. Absolutely. It's yeah. stunning. But oh, she's, thanks, she's a very much, uh, you know, she's very much a... Uh, Old soul. But she cares about what her parents think. She has the parental order very much still in her thinking patterns. And, and it, Greeks are much more, you know, culturally familial. Absolutely. Than other, so other yeah. ethnicities. So I would say that you're you're more eager to abide by authority than go against it. Yeah, and and, I, and I'm the same way. I mean, right. uh, Greg, Greg's. The I've one. been. I was like, I had. I can't remember what my experience was that made me so anti-authority as a young kid. That I've been an iconoclast and absolutely immediately whatever the status quo was, I viewed it sus- suspiciously. Right. Mm-hmm. Since I was a very young kid, I, but I, then I would do whatever I had to to avoid getting in trouble. Yeah. Well, and I'm. I mean, I kind of agree with that. However, I I think it's more of because I'm the sw- same way. But I, for me, it's more of I look to the people like you know baby boomers or older millennials, the other ones you know. They're they've been around longer. They've they've had these successes. They they've. We're here when, you know... They've seen, you know, they've actually experienced it rather than just re- talking about it out of a book. They, yeah, they've experienced the real deal instead of recreating panic for <laughs> our chance to be in the history books. Yeah, she's also feeling out the edges of intellectual rebellion. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so she's she's kind of going, okay, all, all these things that I've been taught, I'm going to question a little bit. I want to know what what is really going on. And I see all these people who tell me I th- should think this way, but it doesn't match what I've been taught. And I'd, what if nothing's true? Let me all figure it out. And the, the, so. the big Live disconnect. on this podcast. This is a real... This is... This, you know what this is? This podcast, this show, is now watching me grow up. Yep. And just... You're like be woke. you're like our little DJ Tanner. I'm a little, I'm a little, <laughs> little DJ Tanner. I'm Cut gonna, it out. <laughs> yeah, it, you're, I'm going to come back in 30 years for the. All right, welcome to We Are Libertarians episode 4,000. Let me tell you how wrong you mother. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to walk in and be like, "Hey guys, my name is no longer Catherine. <laughs> it's I don't number have, I don't go by a name. <laughs> Names are a social construct. I'm number four two seven. The thing is, what's really funny is if you think about it, is that only in he, the human experience. Do we even talk about things because of our ability to reason like social construct or cat's awful, awful breath? Sup. Mm-hmm. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, but so so like when you we talk about like in nature, there isn't this concept of equality. There are mm. lions that are at the top of the food chain or the top of the food chain, there's a hierarchical natural order. Only in the human experience do we take well, what is fairness? What is justice? What is equality? And so you have to wonder sometimes is like all the best learning, it does not correspond at whatsoever to our actual biological experience. Right. And so like what Kat's going through is everything she's learned, She it's shocking you kind of identify as libertarian though, because usually it's, I was raised in a strict or in a very structured upbringing. I've always respected authority. I get to college. What I've been taught no longer corresponds with what I'm experiencing. I'm going to just go radically the other way and be a hardcore feminazi that doesn't shave my armpits and wears work, you know, military boots. Well, she does those things. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hashtag fashion. Hashtag fashion. <laughs> Hashtag accept me. But in- interestingly, like you're sort of like dancing in between the two. Right. You 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 cherry pick from both sides what you've found to work for you. But you're still on like a discovery process. And I think it's yeah, and I think it's because, you know, yeah, like I grew up learning one thing and I get to college and 
it's totally the opposite. It's radically like, different. Radically different. And it's all these kids who I see it, and I kind of like to see things through a third party's perspective. An independent, yeah, outside and, perspective. You know, I see these kids, well, okay, of course they're rebelling against their parents because they're, I look at the science of it, they're on their own, they're doing this, they're doing that. And that's the new well, status symbols, rebe- you know, in college is rebellion. And I see, you know, uh, the 60s, the 70s, these people who were rebellious and now they're working corporate jobs. Oh, John Kerry actually <laughs> led a protest against American imperialism and intervention after Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Now, Prior, you know, in the last administration, he's the man that was head of Secretary of State and <laughs> arguably the biggest globalist. In the, I mean, right. the most neoconservative type of individual. I mean, he was the one who drew a red line for going into Syria. Like, and right. this is a guy who protested the war mm-hmm. in Vietnam because, you know, it's now we know that what is true is that we they were his whole generation. He lost friends. They were lied to about the Gulf of Tonkin. The United States instigated it uh-huh. in order to draw the United States into a war to stop what was the best foreign policy thinking at the time, domino theory, that mm-hmm. communism from Karl Marx would spread like wildfire, like dominoes. Yep. Turns out it doesn't work because eventually you run out of other people's money to spend. Yep. And so we were drawn into that. All these people died, and it was decided by elites in a private circle. And then this guy, it's so ironic, he's the one doing the deciding among the group of elites. Yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> so, yeah, if do people moderate? Yeah. Of face. Exhibit A. Right. Exhibit A. And Especially because their personal interests start to align. Right. And and so I think that's interesting, you know, as I grow up seeing it one way and then I get to college and it's radically different and um, these people are protesting, but because of the way I grew up and partially because I'm the third party kind of person uh, or third independent view, thinker. independent thinker, I guess, is that I see what they become. Mm-hmm. And so my question is, I like to learn a little bit of everything. Like we said, I'm a curious person and I don't know, it's just, it's interesting. It is. Where do you think it'll go, though? This is me demanding you critically think. Where do I think the country will go? Where do you think it'll go? I mean, before this discussion, I thought we're just going to all be numbers and blobs and nothing will be anything and all of that. But I don't know. Now, like you said, it's not a new thing. They're 70 years too late. And I think people's I think at the end of the day that if it if it could work and it would be better for society, it would have happened. This is 2017. You know what I mean? The mm-hmm. earth's been around 2017 years old, but so you're <laughs> saying that based on historical evidence that you think it will moderate and won't be as radical of change in societal overthrow as what you, it looks like it could be right now. Yeah. And I think it's because, and also I think we're going to have something and I mean, obviously I hope we don't, but just look at history. It seems whenever humans get too complacent and too cocky, something Something comes. Yeah, some sort of crisis, like existential crisis that that unites that they the define people. them. It defines them from there on. You mm-hmm. you watch the Civil War. You watch the war. Uh, well, that was kin- a war the, of northern aggression. But you watch the Ken Burns documentary, The War, and you just watch the beginning, and it's just like this is like a a species self correcting. Right. You and, know? Well, and it's, uh, society's organic. Like it very yep. much is. It's dynamic. It's constantly changing, and so any you know any action has an equal and opposite reaction. And I think that, like you said, you're people's personal interests will get in the way of things and i think um humanities especially my generation's need and desire to be different will get in the way of the need and the desire to have nice things yeah and do big things because ultimately at the end of uniqueness there is no social reward collective reward uniqueness is bullshit right we're, we're, in and of itself it's a collective thought we're we're all human animals you know it's like indy cars okay indy cars are made by one maker, Delara, and everybody can customize them to certain proportions. But they're still you can put any color paint you want on it, and it still came from Delara. The, you 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 watch F one, and the cars are all made by different people. But at the end of the day, they're all still F one cars. They all work to a, a specific standard, you know. And you know, we talk all the time about okay, well, this happened as a child, so this outcome happens, and this happens, and this behavior takes place, you know, and you know, I'm codependent because of things that happened in my childhood that I've had to work through in my th- in therapy and adulthood. And it's so and stunningly hard. To, you would think it'd be easy once you're aware of it. Right. It, That's what gives me great hope that, like, there is always a there, there's a pullback constantly to any change because it's so hard to let go of even the most things you know and are aware of. Absolutely. And so, a codependent person i am i am an individual i am a a special little snowflake myself but when i go and read books about codependency 
and uh, the adult children of alcoholics, you know, you read the the various like behaviors, behaviors and characteristics you just go, and holy, stories. Holy shit! They just wrote my biography. There is a great book that I recommend everybody read. Uh, it's called Scary Close by Donald Miller. It is a great book. You can read it in two hours. It changed my life, and it is about his, you know, codependency and basically his need to seek out fame and approval from other people and constant and, external validation. And I was just like. This guy just wrote everything that goes on in my head, and uh, and it made you know I I've recommended it to so many friends and so many friends have had their lives changed by it too and I would really highly recommend it and and basically what it comes down to is that we there is a template for the human animal and we all follow that same template and yes we are unique and different and different colors and we need to learn to accept each other but at the end of the day there still is a common bond a common bond and that's why i loved the stuart huff interview that we did at, i think it was around 1 30 140 yeah. one, somewhere in the mid 100s back at the old morty's comedy club yeah 134 i feel like is what my brain is saying and stuart huff basically talked about uh you know this car crash that he saw and human beings ran towards it and not one person as they're running towards a car that had wrecked to help another human being did they ask is this guy a republican mm -hmm. is this guy a jew is this guy black i'm not gonna help him you know is this guy uh slightly sexist like we don't we don't <laughs> does he have a pot is he one of those podcasters, podcasters? we don't we don't ask we could those use questions. a lot does pure. she like taylor swift uh, yeah we just Ugh. help each other and that is the fundam i mean that's that's humanity. we don't like to see her pain like it's that's instinctual and Absolutely. evolutionary is we right. are humans as long as we experience it we don't want to see pain right if we just think about the, the theoretical pain of people experiencing pain and watching it happen that's when everything changes well that's why i do think that a lot of like her snowflake friends like they don't want other people to feel bad and feel offended but at the same time that person i needed i needed to go through the bad things that happened in my life you know, I needed to know that there were these things that happened that caused this thing, and all that made me tougher, smarter, funny. It, it, you know, it's it's. You all can't about. appreciate good until you've experienced bad. I, I listen to those Taylor Swift songs, and I see the depth in Taylor Swift's lyrics because of the pain that I have gone through in life. Yeah, I'm telling you. And so, uh, I would also recommend that people go and watch uh, Oliver Stone's documentary, uh, "The Untold History of the United States." I recommended it in previous podcasts. It's on Netflix still. And it is it is a, a a longer, more in depth overview of kind of a lot of what we've talked about tonight, and you just see how history comes together and how things like the Cold War. The Cold War wasn't inevitable. The Cold War was a choice, a choice that our policymakers made. Mm -hmm. Ideas that conflicted. Ideas that conflicted. And so go and check out the Untold History of the United States by Oliver Stone. It's a it's a great documentary on Netflix. All right, thank you everybody oh, for can joining I us. Go ahead. Just do the last. Um, basically, I would just I would tell Cat to think about these things because this will basically give you your. Once you figure flush this out on what which side you come down on, it'll sort of flush out the rest of what you believe your whole life is that. Shoot. There are two schools of thought, for a philosophy, and it's that are humans a blank slate or are humans is there something that is are they an animal with like in, you know instincts in their are predis predisposed to certain beliefs and behaviors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once you figure out which side you believe that, then that's where conservative versus like communist and liberal thought starts because if you're a blank slate, we can make it do whatever we want and create a perfect world. Mm -hmm. If there are certain things we'll never be able to eliminate, we should always be conscious of those and let be conservative in what we, you know, uh, prescribe and how we craft things and what, mm -hmm. always consciously be aware that this may conflict with our nature. And so all of political philosophy and political thought, no matter where you go, and even religious thought to an extent, begins with uh, how you view a man in his original state. And then beyond that, like the reason I'm a libertarian is that all of collectivism and Karl Marx assumes that man in his original state is with a group of people. I believe that man in his original state is an individual, because that's how I view things. And so man in, his, in an individual state, or you arrive at totally different conclusions if he's alone, rather yeah. than if he's with a group of people, and you introduce, you know, would we talk about sharing and, you know, preventing anyone from being really poor if we don't know what we're good at in that state. Yeah. And so just think about those things always, and then think about if something's trendy, and it's seen, it becomes like a virtue symbol or a status symbol among the 
cool kids at, at Ball State. Just go and investigate the history. Mm-hmm. And then I want to hear how you combat this and what you're going to do about it during your college experience. If you're going to tangle with it or if you're going to just accept that they'll eventually change. Because even Plato wrote about how damned the next generation was. Yeah. 500 years before Christ, they were having the exact same things about societal collapse because of the ridiculous Gen Zers and their, you know. Their George George Orwell wrote Animal Farm in 1984 because of the imminent collapse of society into a, a communistic state, and here we are. You know, and it's the same discussion right. happening now. There are always there is change, but the fundamentals don't change. In that, once you become less familiar with the way a trend is going, you're even you, you just you're sure that's the path to hell. Uh, yeah, I yeah, and that's all. All lectures over, all classes right. out. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of We Are Libertarians. Thank you, Kat, for being here. Thank you for having me, boys, because we're the three best friends, the <laughs> three best friends, the three no, best no, co-hosts, honestly, the three best friends. The whole show is your your question. Absolutely. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. We're just going to You're coming the- into your own. You're feeling, you're starting, oh you're starting to get a bit uppity. Oh. You're starting to take some, you know, authority that you clearly do not have. Yikes. <laughs> we're going to have to uh, change the name of the show to We Are Teaching Cat. I feel like I'm going yeah. to have to be Roger Sterling a little bit and make hey. sure she knows that the coffee needs to be done. Well, maybe if I have these questions, somebody out there might have the same ones. So oh, we all do. We if all I can answer one person's questions beside myself, yeah. I won. I was listening to a great podcast that I love called Bad Christian, mm-hmm. all one word. And it, don't do that. Stop that. Uh, you're making noise. It's not a toy. Oh, sorry. Uh, Some listener paid for that. I'm teaching. I'm teaching her mic technique. Uh, I stand behind her, wrap my arms around her. And That's say, what the Google the- search was about. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> help. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, the And so they were they sound like new libertarians to me because there is a paranoia about the imminent end of the United States and society. And I remember feeling the exact same way 10 years ago. And our parents had did our their parents yep. did. Every generation has always thought their generation was the one that was the end. Yep. We the just, last great generation. We just have to keep fighting against uh, tyrannical bullshit and uh, remember that we are the ones, th- the goal of this podcast and the goal of you listening, uh, our, our goal is at this point not even to restore a constitutional government. It is just to continue to spread the ideas of liberty and to continue. Infect the minds. And, and infect the minds in, in much in the same way that the uh, little document from the mid-50s that he read about cultural Marxism uh, we have to articulate a, liber- a society that embraces liberty. So that, Our plans and goals. So that far in the future, some some fat kid on a Saturday night, lonely, laying in his bed. <laughs> Got his girlfriend pregnant from a hand job. <laughs> <laughs> has thankfully made it through that. Funniest story. thing ever. And oh. so uh, is laying in his bed reading 1984 going, I'm going to make sure this never happens to my society. Damn right. And so that's, Or revolts entirely. That is what we are doing here, and we hope that you will spread the word of We Are Libertarians, that you will tell your friends about us. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us here on this episode of We Are Libertarians. And as always, we promise to do better next time.